Good morning, Austin. Good morning. We're calling to order commission meeting number 289 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on uh, Thursday, February 13th at 10 a.m. at the Massachusetts Gaming Commission offices here at 101 Federal Street in Boston. We'll begin with item number two, Commissioner Stevens. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, in your packet, we have the final draft of the minutes from the December 19th, 2019 meeting. I'd move their approval subject to correction for any other remaining typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Second. I just had one um, comment on. This is December 19th. This is December 19th. Yeah. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, and I just picked it up. Um, it's on page three at the top. It's just a spelling issue. Um, uh, under 1043, the first item, third paragraph, just disparate treatment is the, is the word there. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. We'll make that change. It's just a technical change. Yeah. The grammar Did police. Commissioner Zuniga, do you have any no. suggested edits? I second the motion from Commissioner I'm Stavis. sorry, I, I missed it. Thank you. So any I further edits motion. then? Okay, those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5 0, thank you. Moving on to the second set of. Sure. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, colleagues, you have in front of you the meeting minutes from the January 23rd, 2020 full commission meeting. I'd move their approval uh, with exception of a couple of insertions I would like to suggest um, in one correction. Uh, first at the 10.18 a.m. Uh, time point uh, when we were discussing the draft Regency RFI and requests for public comment, um, I'd like to insert a paragraph that kind of uh, kicks off that discussion. I know the chair had some uh, substantial comments uh, that led to that discussion, so I think it's important to point out how that uh, subject matter was kicked off. Um, I would like to include the chair began, began the discussion of this topic, stated the commission's sincere interest in being deliberate with respect to considering a license award in Region C and the potential impacts to the Commonwealth. The chair discussed the importance of seeking professional guidance through the proposed RFI to better assist and inform our deliberations as well as receiving the input of the general public. And then further on page eight, as we were all discussing the update on the executive director search, um, I think there was a note after my comments midway down the page, and I would just offer to insert uh, the chair added that would be helpful to solicit an outside firm to assist the commission with understanding the needed qualifications of the next executive director, engage the MGC staff for their feedback, and produce a job description that would be useful in attracting candidates. Um, again, you know, it's been interesting over the last few meetings as we go through a number of topics. Um, I want to make sure that we're not missing out on anybody's explicit comments. We're obviously doing a lot of brainstorming around some of the topics, so I hope anybody will feel free to just visit with me um, and we can add a note of interest that you want to make sure is included in this. Obviously, everything is in the transcript, but to make some uh, alignment between uh, kind of the uh, meeting minute record and the trans transcript, I think, is appropriate. Uh, the other change I would just recognize down at the bottom of page eight, uh, at the 1203 mark, the motion passed four to zero, not four to one, with Commissioner Zuniga abstaining. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just have one additional so technical um, correction, I believe, um, similar to yours on the middle of page nine. I think that. Um, it's it, well, salary is not necessarily a, I think it's determinant than detriment for what the salary will be for the next. Is that commission, Commissioner Zuniga? I want it, it's your, so I want to make sure it's accurate. Can you tell me again? Right above 1212 on page 
9. I think I was talking about determinant, not Deter detriment. Oh, it's Commissioner so Stebbins, my apology. Mm -hmm. Determinant rather, than, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just in the same vein of the abstention, the, it should also say 4-0 at the top of page 9, right? <laughs> rather than the 4-1. Yes. Yep. Good. Thank you. So those are just a couple technical right. with the, the more um, substantive additions that just reflect a couple points with respect to my remarks. But those amendments, did you have additional? I do have one, uh, one comment um, on page two. Um, halfway through the section of 1008, which is at the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, where it says that, um, that I requested that the staff check the software platform for Play My Way that is in place in Plain Ridge Park Casino. The point that I was trying to make is about configurability is that, that, that staff ensure that the Play My Way software that is being developed for MGM and uh, Win have the capability to be configurable unlike the one currently in place at Plain Ridge Park Casino. So um, I, will, I will edit it uh, accordingly, but um, but the point is that uh, we would like to have the flexibility of some configuration for what is currently in development, which is something we've made uh, the, requ the request before. Do you have a recommended language for the change now? Uh, yeah, yeah, I would, it, you know, um, I would insert where it says um, software platform of Play My Way that is strike in place and insert being developed for MGM and WIN, continue striking uh, the rest of it um, to you ensure mean, that configuration is. Um, you mean EBH and, and? Yes, EBH, uh, MGM yeah. and WIN. Oh. Uh, EBH, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. um, to ensure that some configuration is uh, part of the software. Um, unlike, and then insert back what is currently in place at PPC. Do you have that? I can, I can give you the exact wording. <clears throat> With those edits, do we have a motion? I'll second that motion with oh, those amendments. I'm sorry, I lost track of the original motion was made by, by Commissioner, Commissioner Stebbins mm -hmm. with those edits. Okay. Any further edits? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, moving on to item number three, our interim executive director. Karen Wells, thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. Good morning. Uh, so uh, for the general update, uh, one thing I'd like to just mention, I think you all may be aware, but to just publicly acknowledge is that uh, it was announced yesterday that Jim Murren, the CEO of uh, Wynn Resorts, is going to be stepping MGM. down. MGM. What did I say? You said Wynn Resorts. Oh, pardon me. I apologize. Of MGM uh, International. So. Uh, you know, one of the things we we noticed with, with Jim, uh, A, was his support for the Springfield project. And I think uh, we'd like to acknowledge that that was a big deal to Massachusetts. He was very supportive, uh, and uh, that was very helpful to us in the process going forward. Uh, the other thing with respect to Jim is that uh, he did a lot with diversity and diversity in the workplace, and, and that MGM International did a lot with that. Um, you know, under his leadership. So that's just something I'd like to, you know, publicly acknowledge. And he is going to be staying on until a replacement is found. There's going to be a, uh, a process to find someone's, uh, another uh, CEO. Uh, but during that time, he'll still be there. So it's not as if he's gone as of today. He'll still be there. But just wanted to acknowledge that transition with MGM um, and just recognize us uh, and the great work that he did. Yeah, I. Um I make it a point to listen to the conference calls, um, you know, on the um, on the parent companies of the uh, of our licensees, and he, like like other uh, CEOs, has, has been 
a great leader and, and, and very much in command of a lot of the um, issues that are important for the kind of company that he leads. And uh, when people look back at his tenure, and some publications already are, uh, they'll see that there's been a tremendous um, moving forward of such an organization. And I think the, um, the support and use of Play My Way company-wide is very noteworthy You mean Game as Sense? Well. I'm sorry, yeah, Game Sense, yes. Yeah. Game Sense um, is, is really noteworthy, too. Well, <clears throat> I know that uh, Mr. Murren uh, had a background in urban design, had studied that in college, and when you visit MGM, you see that vision where he, mm -hmm. um, with mm -hmm. the help of his entire team, really integrated a very special property into Springfield. So for us, it's a legacy here in Massachusetts that he had that vision and, uh, <clears throat> and the ability to execute it. <clears throat> I suspect that MGM will continue to be well served by his successor, but uh, a, a very uh, lovely gentleman, and I know a friend to the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. So we wish him good luck on whatever steps he's going to take next. Right. So <clears throat> thank you for that, Karen. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention, uh, as you're aware, I did go to the, uh, as a member of the AGRA board, IAGR, International Association of Gaming Regulators. I was there for a board meeting last week. It was my first opportunity to sit in person uh, with the board members and discuss a variety of topics. It was a very long meeting, very productive meeting. But just to highlight for you, um, the most important thing for me was just what an amazing group of people. Like I got to meet these people from all over the world and get different perspectives on gaming regulation and different issues and a really uh, great team. So I want to thank you for allowing me to be part of that and just acknowledge uh, what great work they're doing and you know the excitement about coming to Massachusetts uh, for the 2020 conference in September um, is, is really there. They're working very hard on that. and so. Uh, this all seems to be going very well, and I had a very positive experience with that board. So I just wanted to mention that. Uh, and we thank you for s stepping up and taking uh, a leadership role on an international basis. In fact, I just got an email from one of your board members recognizing us as a leader in um, some of our diversity issues, and she was looking for help um, with with um, how they can implement um, that's great. some of the things that we've done in, in Norway. Oh, that's great. Excellent. Uh, the other uh, piece I'd like to um, actually turn it over to our CIO. Um, we, you had asked for some sort of more information about what's going on in the office. So we were um, thinking that on a rotating basis, bring in some of the leadership in the office to give you a first-hand look at some of the things that are, that are going on in the office. So. Uh, Katrina volunteered to be first, and of course, and you know, you'll be impressed with her presentation. But I wanted to let her tell you, not just me reporting, uh, but let her tell you herself what's going on uh, with things in the IT side of the house. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners, Good morning. Interim Executive Director Wells. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share with you this morning about the activities, projects, and changes that have and are occurring in the Information Technology Services Department. First, I'd like to share with a quick update on our current org structure and identify some of our new additions and their roles. Um, as you can see from the org chart, the ITS department has grown and made some significant changes to our current structure to better leverage the skills and the talent of our team for the benefit of the commissions, its needs, and um, our mission at large. I will delve into a little bit more detail later about the major divisions and some of their key responsibilities and projects. To start, the ITS department is carved into two major groups, uh, the corporate technology group and the gaming technical compliance. In the corporate technology division, we have Tim Drain, who is our infrastructure manager, and he's responsible for the infrastructure and client services team. And I'll explain that a little bit later, what that actually means. And his group comprises of a new addition, uh, David Wingshi. He's a senior systems engineer on the infrastructure side. It also includes Ben Bishop, our senior service desk specialist, Taylor Greenwood, a service desk specialist on a temp basis. We do have an open position that has not been posted yet for a new technical support analyst, which was recently vacated. Kevin Gavro is our senior converged engineer who's responsible for network telecommunications and security. 
Tamron O'Connor is our IT operations coordinator who is responsible for all the business operations needs of the IT department, which includes IT purchasing, vendor management, account management, and other administrative functions. We currently have a cloud specialist position that is vacant, but due to immediate project needs, we brought in a cloud consultant by the name of Tahir Zafar to assist in the interim. On the Gaming Technical Compliance Division, we have Scott Helwig, our Gaming Technical Compliance Manager, who's responsible for the GTC team, as we like to call them, and the Network Operations Center, which we also like to refer to as our NOC. Priya Gandotra, our Technical Compliance Engineer, along with Scott, is responsible for reviewing, testing, and evaluating electronic gaming devices, commonly known as EGDs, assessment of player tracking systems, slot monitoring systems, and accounting systems for interoperability. The major service areas as shown on the following slides provides more details as to what each group does. However, I'll only highlight a few uh, to be time sensitive. The service desk, which is the client services division, is the voice and face of ITS. They provide tier one and tier two support, which includes issues like password resets, desktop support, break fix issues, PC troubleshooting, account issues, or problems with email. The infrastructure team manages your, your back end, user accounts in Active Directory, email, servers, imaging, storage, and backups. Network and Telecom designs and maintains the network backbone and architecture for connectivity, voice over IP, and security. The gaming technology team manages the test lab, electronic gaming devices, central monitoring system, our house system here at the Gaming Commission, technical compliance and regulations, and day-to-day -day, day -day operations of the NOC. Currently, ITS has 15 active projects. Sorry, forgot about forwarding my slides here. Uh, the ITS department has currently 15 active projects, of which I'll only highlight the following. O365, Azure, Cybersecurity, Grant Management Application, Play My Way, and IGT Advantage Testing. O365 is the new subscription-based model of Microsoft's Office suite of enterprise-grade productivity applications through the cloud and includes collaboration tools and improved security and upgrades. And a lot of these upgrades occur on an, about a 90-day basis. Traditionally, uh, whenever upgrades occurred, the IT department had to physically touch the units for those upgrades to happen. This is all automated at this point. Azure is a collective set of cloud services that allows us to build, manage, and deploy applications and services through a Microsoft managed data center. These two items go hand in hand, and we're very happy to report that we are on track and plan to have full implementation within three months. More communication regarding timelines and training will be disseminated internally very soon. We will also be launching a new cybersecurity awareness training to the commission. This is slated for April. It will include online on-demand training with a quiz at the end. It will cover the major tenets of security. The new platform also allows for reporting as well as doing iterative training throughout the year through phishing, exercises, and social engineering. And as you remember from our cyber awareness class, phishing is email seeking info using false information. And social engineering are devised plans to secure confidential information and give you that sense of urgency. So we're really excited to launch this to the staff in the near future. In conjunction with the Ombudsman's Office, ITS is working on an application solution for grant management to allow better processing, tracking, and reporting. This application will also provide metrics and automation for communication and applicant da data. The GTC team is also working on upgrading the lab to Advantage 9.7, which provides the platform necessary to run Play My Way. The lab currently runs both 9.4 and 9.7 for congruent testing of equipment running on their platforms. We had hoped to have the testing environment uh, implemented back in November. Unfortunately, due to the system provider, we had delays in getting, uh, getting their deliverables. Uh, the GTC team is currently working in testing, on testing Play My Way in the lab for functionality, patron experience, and reporting. Through these efforts, we're able to test the interval alerts based on a player's budgetary settings for their daily, weekly, and monthly limits. In conjunction with the research and responsible gaming team, we are ensuring that reports generated from the system capture the data sets and requirements needed. I have a couple of questions on those initiatives, just broadly. Um, the Play My Way um, that you describe, is that for PPC or? EDH no, this, and is, MGM. this is specific for the Advantage system, which is the house systems for both MGM and Encore Boston Harbor. 
Okay. Um, and uh, on the grant management, is that for the community mitigation grants? Correct. Um, I'm not aware of um, the um, state of development, but my um, recommendation would be that we do some of the, what we've done in the past, especially with, um, with the licensing management system in terms of the agile methodology that we don't go down the path too far in terms of developing without the user um, interface, the user knowing and being engaged. And I know you mentioned the, the ombudsman's office. Yeah. Um, I think there's a need there in term, because the grants are coming more and more and there is now a need to really evolve from a spreadsheet or, or, or you know, or, or uh, paper documents. Uh, but I wouldn't want that development process to go so far imagining a future state that might leave us with the need to come back and rethink it soon thereafter. Yeah, absolutely, Commissioner Zuniga. We actually have a team that has been comprised of the Ombudsman's Office. It also includes uh, Jill Griffin, um, members of her team, as well as finance. So we have been evaluating products, and we're actually at the phase where they're demoing to us using some of our actual structure and framework to see if that's going to do what it needs to do for us before anything is even implemented or accepted. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's the right approach, I think, to have multi uh, perspectives. Uh, I've, I've just seen in the past, not here, in my prior uh, jobs where a task force like this thinks of you know, the best case scenario for everybody's perspective and then very soon the, the effort turns really big. Um, and you know, yeah, we, we don't want to risk the, the collapse of something like that. Well, I think it's very exciting uh, to have your assistance in helping um, on the projects such as the grant management because just as Commissioner Zuniga indicates, it, it, is, it has grown and I'm sure that the scale will be, in terms of your solutions, will be proper. But I also suspect that this is all the uh, the, the scope and scale is addressed in the budgeting process mm -hmm. in, in uh, sort of a line, a, a line item basis. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, yes. so there'll be, time, there'll be a chance Absolutely. for us to be reviewing this, but I suspect that <clears throat> our ombudsman and team and, uh, will be appreciating whatever tools you, you create. Can, in terms of cybersecurity training right now, it's <clears throat> you're not addressing cybersecurity from a technological point of view, you're talking about training internally? Correct, correct. Uh, you, you know, uh, based on some of the classes that I've done internally here, the human element is a huge part of cybersecurity. And so the better equipped and more knowledge that our staff has on appropriate transactions, what are they doing with emails, things to be on the alert for, really helps us be better about protecting our environment. So yes, this is, this is focused on training. We are doing the security elements behind architecture, and obviously for security reasons, we would not divulge that uh, publicly. But the, tr the, the program that we're launching in April is focused on user training. Well, I certainly have noticed the upgrade in attention to um, assisting everyone in this in this organization with technical needs, with um, training. Um, it, it's really noticeable and um, you're always inviting us to, uh, you know, train on a new system we may have implicated. So it's, it's, um, it's really helpful. So thank you for, for that and your staff is very professional and knowledgeable. Thank you, Commissioner Cameron. Yes, our big, our biggest challenge is disrupting your team when they sit down at our our joint efforts, they all like to be clustered together. You've got a strong <laughs> group who really like to work together. We do, together. we do. Yeah, so this is very helpful. And I, this is only a snapshot of nine of 15 current projects. Correct. Great, it's very exciting. Thank Good you. work. Good work. Thank and you, thank you. Thank you. So if this uh, format is helpful, I can continue to ask senior leadership at the organization to come brief mm -hmm. you at you know, different public meetings on, on what's going on in their departments and you have a little time to interact with them at, at this level. I think that would be helpful. I, like I think it. it's very helpful because we hear about word of mouth, you know, what one division is doing, or, you know, and it, it, this is a very helpful to see it, to understand it in an okay. organized format. Okay. Excellent. 
Yep. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to uh, now move on to uh, item B within uh, the administrative update. Just wanted to give you a status report. Uh, the uh, Region C RFI and re request for public comment as directed by the Commission that has been posted and the responses are due on March 16th. And I would like to note that there was a, a we did receive a significant amount of media coverage. I'd like to compliment our uh, communications team for their efforts on that area in that area. So they, they did uh, get a lot of media coverage announcing the open comment period. And I'd also like to thank the local press for helping us spread the word because that helps with the, the process. And uh, we continue to promote the request through our social channels on a routine basis. So there's still an ongoing effort to get information out there that, that we're looking for these responses. Uh, so we will circle back with you after those responses are in and provide you with the information that we receive. Okay. okay. Any questions so the, on that? Any, okay. any questions? So the next item on the agenda, I do have uh, two MGM qualifiers. Uh, which are uh, on the agenda for your vote for their suitability this morning. <coughs> so I will start with uh, Ms. Janet Swartz. Uh, she is a, a director, an outside director at MGM Resorts International. Uh, the uh, ultimate final investigators on, on this case were Mike Banks and Faye Zhao, although I have mentioned to you there, there was delay in, in a couple of these because there had in part because there had been multiple assignments due to internal issues. Uh, but the, the final investigators were Mike Banks and Faye Zhao that completed the investigation. Uh, in March of 2018, she took a position as an outside director. Uh, now, as you know, MGM Resorts International is the parent company for Blue Tarp Redevelopment, our licensee. Uh, and based on that position, she was determined to be an individual qualifier for MGM Springfield. Uh, as uh, during the course of the investigation, as per uh, our normal course of uh, procedure, we did confirm her identity through various methods. Uh, she was um, uh, educated at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, uh, Charlottesville with a Bachelor of Arts in 1992 for economics. Uh, she then continued her education at the Harvard Business School in Boston, earning an MBA in 1996. Uh, we did confirm both degrees through the National Student Clearinghouse and contact with the school registrar. As to her employment, uh, she indicated and the, the investigators spoke with her about uh, working at MX Media from 99 in 1999 until 2000 as their chief executive officer. She also worked in a, very, a variety of positions at Princess Cruises, uh, Vice President of Strategy and Business Development, Sales and Customer Service, Executive Vice President of Sales, Marketing and Customer Service. She was eventually named President in 2013. And then from 2016 until President, she's Group President of Princess Cruises and Carnival Australia. As a result of her position as an outside director for MGM Resort, she was required to apply uh, to the following jurisdictions to determine suitability. Uh, the New Jersey Ga Division of Gaming Enforcement, Michigan Gaming Control Board, Maryland Lottery and Gaming Control Agency, the New York State Gaming Commission, and the West Virginia Lottery. Uh, as the date of the report, she was found qualified in New Jersey, Michigan, and New York State. And our information is it's still pending in Maryland and West Virginia. Uh, She also had uh, in her position uh, with various, with her uh, uh, positions in the cruise line, she had to be uh, licensed for applications for various liquor licenses. And she, uh, we confirmed that those licenses were in good standing with no derogatory information. Beyond her directorship at MGM Resorts International, she also serves on the board for Cruise Line Industry Association. Uh, located in Washington, D.C. She's been on that board for approximately eight years, and that's a non-compensated position. She also stated she serves on several internal boards within the Princess Cruise Line Corporation for internal governance. Uh, she, was, uh, she was interviewed and had discussion with the investigators uh, regarding her submission on her multi-jurisdictional personal history disclosure form about uh, civil litigation. She's had uh, Various litigation uh, it, through her position as the princess in Princess Cruises in the ordinary course of business. Um, 
but nothing regarding her individual capacity or anything regarding her individual behavior. Uh, we also indicate we also reviewed uh, criminal history, media coverage, references, and did a deep dive into her financial suitability. All in all, there were no significant issues uh, discovered which would negatively impact her suitability, and the IEB found that she demonstrated suitability by clear and convincing evidence, so we were recommending that the commission find her suitable uh, under our regulations and our law. Yeah, it was a very clean investigation, and um, Madam Chair, I would move that the commission find Janet Swartz suitable as a qualifier for Blue Top Redevelopment, LLC. Second. Any questions? Excuse me. Any questions for Karen? Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the second qualifier for your consideration is Mr. Uh, Craig Jacobs. He is the Vice President of Information Technology Operations at MGM Resorts International. Uh, similar to the other qualifier, this uh, investigation also had numerous uh, investigators, but it was uh, the finalization report or the finalization of the report was done by uh, Mr. Kevin Owen and uh, financial investigator Fei Zhao. Uh, as suitability is always ongoing with our licensees, both at the corporate level and at the individual level, you know, we also uh, we decided to take a look at our, our licensees uh, to see if. Uh, in addition to what we looked at through our original scope of licensing, if there were any other individuals or, that we should be capturing for suitability. So we, uh, we undertook that process in 2018. And taking a look, we uh, made the determination under our authority of the regs and under the law that we'd like to capture the Vice President of Information uh, Technology in, uh, operations because it has such a significant role uh, with IT that that really is important and we'd like to make sure that uh, that that individual is suitable under our standards. So uh, as a result, he was deemed a qualifier. Um, he had been working there since 2014, but this wasn't until later in 2008 or until 2018. Uh, he, Similar to the protocol for the previous qualifier, his identity was confirmed through our normal protocol. Um, he, as for his, as for his education, uh, he graduated from Collier County High School in 2001. Then he attended Murray State University in Murray, Kentucky, where he got a bachelor's degree in telecommunications systems management and management. After graduation in 2005, he continued at Murray State University, where he earned a, earned a master of business administration in 2006. Both his degrees were confirmed through the National Student Clearinghouse degree verification. Prior to working at MGM Results International, he had uh, worked at uh, Affinity Gaming in Las Vegas and Nevada from 2006 to 2014, and then, as I stated previously, came to work at MGM Resorts International then in 2014. He does hold a gaming-related license in Nevada. Uh, investigators confirmed with the Nevada Gaming Control Board that he has an active license that revealed no derogatory information. He has never uh, held any offices trustees, directorships, or fiduciary positions with any firm, corporation, association, or partnership, so there were no issues to just, um, explore in that area. Similar to other qualifiers that you have reviewed, uh, we did a check of civil litigation, his criminal history, media coverage, references, and did a deep dive into his financial suitability, and no significant issues were discovered which would uh, warrant a negative finding of suitability on, with respect to Mr. Jacobs. Uh, so, similar to the prior qualifier, the uh, IEB's finding that he demonstrated suitability by clear and convincing evidence, and we are recommending that you approve uh, his suitability. Any questions? <clears throat> Do I have a motion with respect to this uh, um, quali qualifying report? Uh, Madam Chair, I would move that the Commission find Mr. Jacobs um, suitable to hold a, a gaming license. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0, please. Thank you. And that concludes uh, Section 3 of the Administrative Update. And <clears throat> thank you to uh, your entire team at IEB thank you. Uh, for a very thorough, two thorough reports. Thank you. Moving on to Ombudsman Ziemba, item number four, and you'll be bringing up a team from the Springfield area. 
Welcome. I hope the roads weren't too bad today. <laughs> A little slushy out here. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. We have asked MGM Springfield uh, to give the Commission as much detail as it can regarding the status of its residential requirement. As you're aware, earlier this week, Mayor Sarno issued a statement regarding some positive news about the status of the project. Uh, that statement was followed by a review of the project by Springfield's Casino Oversight Committee. In order to provide the Commission further information about this news, uh, today we are joined by Seth Stratton, MGM uh, Springfield Vice President and General Counsel, Tim Sheehan, uh, Springfield's Chief Development Officer, Mark Atia, Assistant Secretary for the Executive Office for Administration and Finance, and Michael O'Brien from the Wynn Companies. Uh, we thank them for coming today and recognize all of their work on this matter. Uh, just by way of background, as you're aware, the Commission has regularly reviewed um, at its commission meetings, the status of MGM Springfield's commitment to provide 54 units of market rate housing within one half mile of the casino. Last year, the commission authorized an extension to comply with this residential requirement until March of this year. The deadline reflected a date set in Springfield's host community agreement with MGM Springfield for the construction of the units. When the commission extended the deadline, there was a recognition that further action would be required both by the commission and the city council because of the complexities of the project um, and the time that would be needed to actually build the 54 units. At the time, the commission required that MGM Springfield shall continue to inform the commission of any material event that would significantly alter the potential of MGM Springfield proceeding with the city's plan to rehabilitate 31 Elm Street in Springfield with the assistance provided by MGM Springfield. Further, the commission required that staff shall remain in contact with MGM Springfield and the city of Springfield to monitor the project, its documentation, its schedule, and report back to the commission at an appropriate time. Uh, we are not asking the commission to take any action regarding the residential requirement at today's meeting. Uh, as will be explained by the group, other actions must occur at the local level to move forward with this project. At the appropriate time, as early as the next commission meeting in two weeks, we will come back to the commission to discuss the content of the approvals that would be needed uh, to be considered by the commission. Uh, while we contemplate no action today, we know that today will be very informative to the commission uh, and indeed to the public. Uh, even after today, we can continue to work with the parties to answer any questions the Commission may have. And with that as a background, let me turn it over to Seth. Thank you, John. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you again. It's been a little while. Um, I will, uh, John's offer to provide as much detail as we can. Uh, I'll resist taking that as a challenge. Um, in the interest of everyone, I'll try to be brief. Um, we have some folks here who who um, have much more, I think, interesting input on this, this project than I do. So um, you have in your packet um, a letter where I did provide a lot of detail with respect to the history and uh, MGM Springfield's um, position and some of the details of our involvement in this project. Um, I will say it does feel like somewhat of an auspicious occasion to be here before you with this group, with, um, with this project, um, from what we can tell you know, on the one yard line um, of moving forward. I, and maybe some of you here, um, may have doubted whether we'd, we'd be here based on the, the length of time that it's taken, the, the number of extensions, which we appreciate. Um, but I think what this uh, group in front of you represents is um, what I've experienced to be um, unprecedented collaboration at the city, uh, state, and developer level with our involvement as well and, and certain other parties uh, to move forward a very complex project that has the potential of being uh, transformative in the revitalization of downtown Springfield to the benefit of the city of Springfield and to the benefit of MGM Springfield 
because the, um, as you're well aware, the project uh, is immediately adjacent to our project and essentially separates uh, MGM Springfield from the, from the vibrancy of the business center and the, the, the effectively the capital of downtown Springfield. So we're excited uh, to move forward. I'll assume your familiarity with the project and a lot of the details provided in my letter. I'll just briefly highlight for you um, the key elements of MGM Springfield's involvement, and then I'll turn it over to our partners uh, up with me here today. So effectively, um, MGM Springfield will be working with the city uh, to amend our host community agreement, which embodies the original uh, 54 unit um, housing residential development requirement. We will seek an amendment uh, to that uh, host community agreement, which in lieu of of uh, developing 54 units ourselves, we will make a $16 million contribution to a development uh, fund, which will fund a loan through Mass Housing, um, which uh, will, with certain other funds, will provide additional funding to the, to the developer to fund uh, the 31L project. In exchange for that $16 million contribution, um, we'll effectively have a, a long-term loan interest um, in, in the um, property. We won't be the lender, but um, uh, we will um, not have any debt service on that. So it's effectively um, more in line with a, a grant, um, at least the original $11 million commitment. Um, we were, um, through, through discussions with the parties, our $11 million commitment grew to, um, we're happy to say we're supporting an even higher level at $16 million. And part of that additional um, funding will result in a uh, minority um, ownership interest in the project, um, uh, which, which we're pleased with. Um, and we will also uh, be in connection with this uh, contribution returning to the city um, an iconic building in downtown Springfield, 195 State Street, which is about a block and a half from our project, the former school department building. Um, we purchased and made improvements to. We'll return that to the city of Springfield, and it's my understanding that the city will seek to have additional, potentially, uh, residential development in that building as well. So um, we view it as a win-win uh, for the city, uh, for us, uh, and, and for um, the residents of the area. We think it'll really help to turn on the city even further. Um, the, the mechanics of the amendment to the HCA amendment itself basically substitute our obligation um, for our compliance with a cooperative funding agreement in which all the parties involved will be signatories to, and that lays out our obligations as well as those of others. And I think, um, and, and that's where um, uh, Mark Atiyah from uh, ANF, who's been instrumental in getting uh, folks together to get this done, um, could, I think, speak to the mechanics and give you a high-level overview of that arrangement. Um, so if there, unless there are further questions for me, um, I'd be happy to turn it over to Mark. Seth, I have one question. Sure. Uh, the um, minority ownership, that hasn't been designated yet publicly, or is that uh, going out for a competitive bid, or how is that being determined? No, so that will be, so effectively, uh, once the project is constructed, the and, and Michael O'Brien could speak to this as well. The property will be, it's currently owned by the city. It will ultimately own, be owned by the developer, an LLC, um, the Win Opal Companies. Um, I understand a special purpose LLC to hold interest in the property. We will take a minority ownership interest in that LLC that owns the I'm so, I understand it's a minority. Okay, so you don't they're have a minority. The, they're the minority owner. Uh, um, you're the minority. I, I misheard. You're the minority um, owner, but in terms of uh, there's not a diverse partner right no, now that's sorry. been designated. That, Thank yeah, you. Minority ownership. Thank you. Of course, I'm only raising a, probably another issue, so <laughs> thank you. No, it's fine. Thank you, and uh, go ahead, Mark. Thank you, commissioners. It's a pleasure to be here. And Nice uh, to see you, Mark. Thank you, and uh, you as well. Uh, and uh, to echo um, um, uh, Seth's comment, uh, I too, uh, feel it's a, it's a fair representation that uh, this is an unprecedented level of partnership with uh, a level of complexity that uh, many of us have not seen. Um, we arrive here today um, 
um, really after six months of, of uh, weekly engagement with uh, a number of parties, maybe one of them on the phone. <laughs> Uh, and um, um, are, are very pleased with the progress we made and very proud of the quality of agreement that uh, we, have, um, we, we have created together uh, with a very clear purpose in mind, which is um, a great deal of uh, alignment of interests, uh, a focus on, uh, on seeing this project come to fruition on a timeline um, that we've, we've determined to be you know, a, a, appropriate. Um, the agreement that Seth referenced, the, the cooperative funding agreement, um, at this stage is um, substantially final, uh, but still subject to review, and therefore there are certain details I cannot discuss, uh, including the names of uh, some of the many parties involved. I, I uh, and, uh, you know, I ask for your understanding. Um, um, but. Uh, I am happy to give uh, you know, a broad overview of how the framework works, and in particular, how the structure gives us uh, uh, confidence that should we reach execution of this document and see the project commence, a very high degree of confidence given the, the um, seasoned and talented operator, the, uh, the nature of the agreement itself that this project will um, 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 come to fruition. Um, very simply on the cooperative funding agreement, this is a, an agreement to capitalize a loan uh, in the form of a construction and permanent loan to finance the development of the, of the, of the project. Um, the, 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 in, in essence, that, that, is the, that is the heart of it. Multiple funding parties, um, aggregating, aggregating capital, to Mass Housing, a seasoned uh, housing finance agency with many decades of experience providing loans for exactly projects like this in order to administer a loan um, you know, in accordance with standard procedures um, that, that, are, that are familiar to the developer here and, 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 and to win. Um, this agreement upon signature will be subject to several preconditions to reach, uh, fun, uh, to reach financial close which um, um, includes, among others, of course, authorization, support from the city of Springfield and their city council to advance the project, um, the necessary permitting that uh, is required you know, to put a shovel in the ground, um, and uh, as John indicated, um, um, you know, agreement on the amendment to the host community agreement and, and um, any official actions required for the licensing agreement. So we believe we're all aligned to see these things happen, but to be sure, the funding is contingent on a number of things happening um, which are necessary. Uh, so uh, we, we think that's a, um, um, a good way of framing uh, uh, where, where, we, where we stand today. One question I know that, is, that has come up um, with respect to the loan is um, what happens if you know, I, this is a construction project, they're complex. How do we control for um, the in, in, uh, inevitable uncertainties that come with a complex historic rehabilitation? Cost overruns, and so on. Um, many, of the, many of these uh, uh, measures of security and protections for the, for the funders and for mass housing and for the developer are described in some detail in the cooperative funding agreement, but ultimately, once we reach financial close and we're operating under, um, you know, the traditional loan and financing agreements, um, you know, pursuant to um, programs under mass housing, we are operating in sort of a traditional uh, commercial lending environment. The developer will, you know, will be required to post um, um, uh, performance and completion guarantees, ensuring that you know we have um, sufficient, you know, um, um, uh, backstop. Know, to, to make sure that the, the project gets complete if there are overruns. Uh, we've contemplated a, 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 a surety for um, mass housing to ensure that the third party funding comes in to capitalize the loan. Um, but even at that point, the developer throughout the construction project and throughout 
really the term of the loan will be subject to our regulatory agreement, um, which is ongoing compliance, certain restrictions on refinancing, um, transfer of asset, um, uh, covenants that uh, ensure fair housing practices are, are um, administered in accordance with, with um, what we call a tenant selection plan. And, um, and of course, that the um, predetermined level of affordability um, as a necessary condition of lending through mass housing is, is adhered to throughout the term of, throughout the term of the loan. So, um, and finally, I would should mention um, our operating agreement and replacement reserve. Mass Housing requires that you know for those projects that they lend, they asset manage these loans um, with a with a, um, um, a great deal of of um, professionalism to ensure that the asset. Um, uh, is always well capitalized, well maintained, well operated, um, and consistent with a high quality um, um, loan, uh, which is you know something Mass Housing does um, uh, really, um, it really with with with, uh, with great excellence. So it, those are some of the broad principles of the cooperative funding agreement. Um, it's the culmination of six months of uh, very hard work, and we're, we're quite enthusiastic uh, to, to see this move forward. I happy to happily take your questions. I have um, one question. Please. You've mentioned overruns and the concern about that, given the complexity of the historic site and the fact that it hasn't been inhabited for over 30 years or decades. Uh, <clears throat> what about uh, time frames? You know, we are looking for housing, and uh, there's some safeguards yes. contemplated for the, in dealing with extensions on time. Yes, so the, the, the cooperative agreement contemplates um, um, certain time limitations in order to commence with the construction project. Um, they are, they are, they are, um, they are they are quite realistic, I'd, mm -hmm. I'd say. You know, within you know within you know within um, um, you know uh, 12 months or so. The, the, that uh, you know, uh, assuming that the agreement is signed and Springfield commences with the necessary um, 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 approval processes to allow the project to start, um, the developer must operate uh, by the time we reach financial close. Um, in a continuous state of construction, and you know, allowing us to hold the developer to performance, you know, as we right. as we as we commence with the, you know, with um, what what um, our partners from Wynn will say is probably an 18 to 24 month project. Um, so there are date limitations um, on uh, on funding. There are expectations of when this project. Um, you know, w will be underway, and there's and there's protections to ensure the project cannot be stalled or slowed. Once you know, once we get once we get started, uh, Commissioner, you asked about um, cost overruns. Just uh, for yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, you seem to address that well, okay. so I just thought in okay. addressing those, but in yeah. terms of time. Uh, <clears throat> before we continue, I just I have um, I, I wish to thank you for all the efforts that you've made on this. You and and John have worked so well together and the collaboration for all of you here is outstanding. I'm looking forward to the continued report, but to you and your colleagues and my old colleagues, um, uh, particularly at Mass Housing, thank you for uh, keeping us so well informed and, and for all the collaborative, collaborative efforts here. Thank you. We think it's a More transformative More questions for Mark. <clears throat> I, I agree. This is very encouraging. The one line, the one yard line. We haven't heard that before. Uh, We're all hoping there are no fumbles. Um, but this is a project. We know how important it is to the city of Springfield. So it is, um, it is important that the highest level of um, government in the, in the Commonwealth got behind this project. And I know everyone's been patient but yet diligent to try to get this done. So it really is encouraging. Thank you. Our pleasure. Yeah, some of the materials and history that you uh, articulate are really remarkable to look back to the fact that this property has been um, vacant for close to 30 years. Is that, is that correct? 
and uh, I'm going to guess that there have been a number of efforts in the past that have, um, uh, for whatever, for many reasons, failed. But um, if, if and when, maybe just when this comes to fruition, um, I think it would be transformative to the city, as as is evidenced by what you describe. And thank you, commissioners. And if I could, um, one obvious and important step, as with any HCA amendment. Um, is that the city has to approve it and the city council plays a critical role. Mm -hmm. um, we had a meeting this past Tuesday with this city council casino oversight committee, um, which um, Mr. Sheen and Mr. O'Brien attended as well, where we presented. Um, and at least from my perspective, it was, it was almost a 180 from some prior um, communications um, on this project with the council. Um, they were enthusiastic, supportive, excited, and very positive um, about this development. And I think that bodes well for um, it, the necessary vote, which will be uh, need to occur before we come back for final approval uh, to this commission. Um, but we're, we, we anticipate that that will go very well. And, and I would invite, I think, um, you know, Mr. O'Brien and Mr. Sheehan to make any further comments about the development or about their perception of the, the city approval process. Madam Chair, Commissioners, um, as the Commission is excited uh, to be at this point uh, with this project at the one-yard line, you can imagine uh, how excited the city is to be uh, uh, here. Um, the project, as you know, is a, a huge asset in terms of its historical significance to the city. Uh, it fronts on Court Square. It's a gateway to the casino itself. It's a gateway from the convention center uh, at the heart of the downtown. Uh, so its transformation uh, will be a game changer relative to downtown Springfield. Um, it, to follow up on the uh, chair's comments with regards to uh, the participation of ANF and Mark in this, it, Mark has done a fantastic job in terms of saying it's, it, it's taken six months. Six months, as all of you know, in terms of timelines and moving a project of this complexity uh, it, it, in terms of financing is lightning speed. Um, so uh, Mark and his team are truly to be congratulated on this effort. Um, and we look forward to uh, advancing this and making an announcement uh, soon. Welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chairman and members of the commission. It's a uh, great pride I'm here with an incredible team of people that have labored over five years uh, to get to this point, uh, uh, MGM and certainly myself. Um, I can tell you that for each of those five years I've invested, I've taken a year off the end of my life because of the nature of the, of the project. Um, but we would not be here without the, the word partnership. Uh, to get some perspective, uh, we talked about the building itself. Uh, 30 years vacant, uh, that has uh, un unfortunately uh, resulted in a great deal of water damage. Um, lack of maintenance and asset management have resulted in structural failures, significant. Uh, and uh, just a, a layman's perspective walking through the building, um, there's significant holes through the floors. There's absolutely no systems that exist in the building. Uh, and that lack of heat through the years and freeze and thaw cycles, as well as uh, various animals that have made a 1331 home uh, have got this building at a point now that it would be lost but for the work that's being done, uh, the stewardship of this commission, the partnership with MGM, the great work of the state, and I compl compliment Mark Atia, right up to the governor and his interest, uh, the city, uh, Mayor Sarnow and his team, including Chief Development Officer Sheehan, uh, and MGM, and, um, and there's other partners, including state agencies, as you've mentioned, uh, private partners yet to be announced, um, and obviously our work with National Park Service and uh, Mass Historic Commission. Um, but for that, uh, this building would be lost uh, to the city of Springfield, uh, to the generations going forward that would enjoy, obviously, it being such a center point in the city. Uh, so I'm thrilled to be part of the partnership. Uh, what I will tell you is the endeavor's extremely costly uh, because we will replicate, re renovate, and restore its historic beauty inside and out. Um, a requirement of historic tax credits, but that's what we specialize in. Wind companies, which I'm an executive vice president, adaptively reuses these types of buildings all over the country and brings them back to that beauty. But along the way, make sure all historic elements are preserved, protected, and 
obviously enhanced for the future uh, as well as making sure there's a right adaptive reuse. 74 apartments, uh, four, 15 of them will be, will be middle income, 59 will be pure market. There'll be 12,000 square feet on the first floor. We have active interest uh, from retailers and restaurateurs to take that space. So I think that says a lot about the city of Springfield and the work that's being done by all the leadership I've mentioned. <clears throat> um, it will be built, obviously, uh, with all ADA standards, uh, and we'll take on all new code to ensure that it's built once, built right, and built for uh, the future as well. Uh, so we look forward to it. It'll be built by union. There'll be a PLA on the project, uh, and we're active with the unions right now in discussions to get to that uh, project labor agreement and have that in place. Um, and so I look forward to working with this commission and obviously all of our partners. I will tell you this, to that partnership, uh, these guys are tough all the nine partners around the table and this agreement is probably as tight as I've ever seen in my professional career with the checks and balances that will be expected in a public-private partnership ensuring each dollar spent wisely uh, with the oversight and management of those dollars to ensure that uh, it's done once done right and done for that future generation and uh, it's just again a measure of pride to be part of such a project thank you thank you thank you um I, I know there's um, you know, questions about uh, uh, risks and, and, and whatnot and overruns, but what about an upside? Let's just assume that everything goes really well and, and, and whatnot. Can you comment on um, who, who gets, uh, what kind of benefits does the city derive from, let's say, a project like this? Besides the economic development around it, um, um, is there uh, anything tangible in terms of this asset if things go really well, let's say? Well, it, it, in terms of the existing state of the building, uh, it's controlled by the Springfield Redevelopment Authority. Um, so it, there's potential tax benefits associated with that in terms of its return uh, as a, an income producing property. Um, there's also, you know, uh, as you, you've seen as a commission, um, the, it, it, there is a need to invest in economic development all around the casino area. Um, um, and this, again, it, activating this space is the first uh, leg of that uh, ongoing effort um, for years to come. Um, and it, it's also a, a tangible that, you know, you're bringing economic spending power of people that are living in those in those units back to the downtown uh, and they will ultimately be frequenting the the retail and restaurants that uh, are in the downtown and you know that that's important to us because it, the economic health of those um, businesses uh, requires more than people being there on Thursday Friday and Saturday uh, there needs to be an active uh, foot presence in the downtown to to economically stimulate uh, both the existing market that's in the downtown and uh, the future market to come. Thank you. Uh, if I could, Madam Chairman, um, when does this type of work, when companies all over the country, and uh, with the project of this significance in its position, I think the Urban Land Institute back in 2006 mm -hmm. designated this as the number one economic development project for the city. Um, the results of this project will be catalytic uh, for obviously its symbolic um, realities, uh, but beyond that uh, of what it will do to create additional uh, um, activity in and around the casino, in and around City Hall, in and around Court Square. Uh, and we've seen it time and time and again, whether it's in Rochester, New York, or it's in Buffalo, or we're down in the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, every time a project like this comes to bear, um, great things happen as a result of it. And uh, the reality of the partnership that's been presented uh, it shows that the city of Springfield is uh, open for business and ready to work on complex things and get things done, and that's a shot heard around the world. So it'll bring other developers uh, to bear to looking at other opportunities. And the city's vision is amazing, and uh, they're working hard to achieve it. And this will be a check in that box that gives other people hope and uh, the inspiration to take on complex projects in Springfield. And if I could add one more piece, we neglected to bring a map, and we're assuming familiarity among this commission with its location, but. Um, it shouldn't be lost that is directly across the street from the state-owned Mass Mutual Center owned by the Massachusetts Convention Center Authority. And uh, effectively, every window from um, the Mass Mutual Center looks out directly on Court Square in this building. And so activating 
um, this property not only for Court Square and neighboring MGM Springfield, but the neighboring Mass Mutual Center uh, and the activate, activation there is, will also have that catalytic impact. Yeah, I would, I would like to, to add and, again, appreciate the, the great partnership that it's, uh, that's been formed. I remember, uh, Seth, to your point, Commissioner McHugh standing on the second floor of the convention center looking out at downtown saying, what a beautiful downtown. Need to do something there. Um, I think what's encouraging for us is that this, uh, this one project completes MGM's commitment. Had you not been able to pull this project off, you would have had to continue to split up the other work uh, between 195 State Street and another location to find the remaining units that you're committed to. So this is a win-win, I feel, in that you're completing your commitment, that property being turned back to the city, hopefully for another developer to take that, you know, this, uh, uh, see the opportunity there and, and uh, turn 195 State Street, hopefully, into a, a residential unit as well as uh, I, I think the best scenario we could have found for the city of Springfield and, and for MGM to meet their commitment. So uh, congrats to, to everybody that's been a part of the team. And Mark and your colleagues at A&F and, and, and Tim and, uh, and the mayor. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, Commissioner Stebbins has pointed out that we do have our work to complete and we will we will be signing off, but I think I probably can fairly speak for um, all of us here that we are keeping our fingers crossed. I came on a year ago and I learned about, I saw this site and was briefed by um, Ombudsman Ziemba and <clears throat> I um, am just right now keeping my excitement very close to my own best, but it is truly a testament to what can happen with proper collaboration and imagination and generosity. It's not lost on us that there is an element of generosity here that um, will be part of this overall project. So uh, <clears throat> we thank you for all your efforts, Mark. You've gotten your kudos. Uh, we um, appreciate all the efforts from everyone. And uh, I, I also would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the fact that we, um, the president, the new president, Chris Kelly, is here um, in the back recognizing uh, his, the import of today's meeting and getting to see us in operation. We will be visiting uh, Springfield at our next meeting, uh, February 27th, where I think we'll have a more proper introduction for Mr. Kelly, but thank you. Uh, to Chris for coming out today, uh, recognizing this is an exciting moment. We wish you luck on on the uh, that last yard. I don't know if it's going to be a run or, or a throw, but we just want that touchdown. I suspect, <laughs> keeping our fingers crossed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, John. Thank you so thank much, you. and thank you, Joe, too. <clears throat> I do too. It's great. Safe, safe travels back to Springfield. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and we have yet another report that we're looking forward to today, very much so, from um, our uh, Director of Workforce Supplier and Development, Jill Griffin. Welcome, gentlemen, and thank you, Jill. Good morning, Chair Judd Stein and Commissioners. Uh, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. For Black History Month, uh, the commission recognizes through this vendor spotlight one of, or the, what we have learned to be the oldest minority-owned business in New England, Owens Movers. 
so this 93-year-old Everett, Massachusetts company attributes their nine decades of success to company culture. Um, with me here today is father and son team, CEO Mr. Eddie Owens, and seated to uh, his right is CFO Ed Owens. Um, and I'm going to give a few introductory remarks and then turn it over um, so you can hear firsthand about this company. But as part of Teamsters Local 25, the company is able to provide its employees with excellent benefits. Um, starting with a horse-drawn cart in 1927, today Owens Movers has 25 employees, performs commercial moving, trash removal, um, and industrial warehousing and storage. And I'm sure I've um, missed some other services. Um, Owens Movers recently worked on Encore Boston Harbor's pre-opening, including moving of table games and restaurant furniture into the casino, along with gaming equipment into the nearby um, dealer training school, and later relocating table games and uh, performing multiple on-demand jobs for them. And Encore Boston Harbor's procurement uh, team indicated they are great, they're so responsive, we love the Owens Moving Company. Um, so again, I'd like to turn it over to um, Mr. Owens and Mr. Owens. <laughs> yes. Good morning, Madam Chair, good and good morning, morning commissioners. Good morning. good morning. Good morning. And thank you very much for the uh, nice introduction there. I can't tell you how pleased I am to be here, how proud I am to be here. Not only that uh, my father started the company uh, with very humble beginnings back in the day, but also my mom lived in Everett. And the thing that got me was when Chief Maisie bought the former CEO out to the site, and he said, this is the best location in the country to have a casino. And my son and family kids me because I've been talking about the casino for the last six years. And I just want to say a few things that it was a pleasure seeing Jackie Crum from the old days, mm -hmm. as well as Commissioner Cameron. Uh, I could sit here all day and talk about my family and, and the contribution of workforce development, but my wife and I were there at the casino and spent a weekend. It was an experience that I never thought would ever come to Everett because my grandmother was from Everett. She worked as an elevator operator downtown. And my mom used to say that they'd have to put the windows up, close the windows. And when I saw that ad about uh, Monsanto and, they, and you promised to clean up the harbor, my mom died at 63, and it was from cancer. And the beautiful job that you've done, and how happy, economically happy, everybody in Everett is, and how proud they are, and the contribution that you're making. You made the best decision. So you made Everett proud, and you made me proud to be here to invite me, and thank you very much, Jill. So on that note, I'd like to hand it over to my son because uh, he's my boss now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say a few things. I'm, I'm the quiet one in the family. Um, thank you again, commissioners, director. I uh, also want to thank uh, Bill Curtis for having us here today. Um, equally as important, I want to thank everyone, Jackie Crum and everyone from 
when an encore for really giving us the opportunity to provide uh, services for the casino. Um, one thing that my dad has always said is that our business will always be based upon relationships. You know, as a moving company, our goal has never been to be the biggest moving company in, in Boston. We want the relationships. Um, it's really the, the quality aspect that has really attracted us to, to Encore. Um, a lot of our employees, we've been very fortunate. You know, we have a great team. A lot of our employees have been with us since I've been a baby. And, you know, they put in a lot of work um, over the past uh, year plus, um, making sure that the execution uh, was up to one standard. So we want to thank everyone from Encore for giving us the opportunity to provide services. Um, we were very excited when the Gaming Act um, went into effect in 2011. In fact, six months later, my dad and I were sending emails, networking, and trying to meet as many folks as we could. And, um, uh, it's, it's, it's been a great experience, and we're very thankful for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I've learned that uh, Owens Movers was one of the first companies to be uh, licensed. Um, uh, so uh, Bill Curtis mentioned um, a very low licensing number, so they, they were one of the first, meaning they, they were anxious and excited about the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love to um, thank you for coming in today. I was uh, smiling when I saw you on the agenda because we did have the opportunity to meet at a charitable event and spend some time together with the entire family. And I'll always remember your comments. You came and spoke to us at a, at a public hearing about what, um, what this could do for Everett. And your comments were inspirational. Um, you were looking at uh, long term, not just for yourself, but for the entire city. And that made a difference. That was part of our decision making uh, because we had two very competitive projects and, and comments like that did weigh into our decision to move forward and, and approve a license in Everett. So I'm happy to see the back end of this because we were there on the front end listening and um, I, I think your family is inspirational as well the way you contribute to charitable events and um, you know you're very proud of everything you do and that that is inspirational and um, thank you thank you for being here today well thank you again for those kind words and uh, as I always say to both of my sons and my daughter to to whom much is given much is expected. Mm -hmm. And I've been blessed that I had two great parents and uh, that provided for us. Uh, my father worked six days a week. Uh, my mom was, stay, was a stay-at-home mom. And my grandmother lived with us. And the, the grandmother was the key because I was the baby in the family. <laughs> and I was the one that there was just a C student <laughs> but I always, I always wanted to go into the moving business because my dad was my hero. And there's not a day that goes by I don't think of my father. And I make decisions. What would dad say? What would mom say? Because mm -hmm. you want to make them proud. Mm -hmm. And um, so I thank you again from my family, my grandchildren, because they're all hearing us. <laughs> thank you again. <laughs> Mr. O Mr. Owens, uh, thank you. Thank you for being here and for your words. Um, the, the experience that you mentioned about um, the casino, did you have an opportunity to dine at it? Um, what would you, how would you rate it? And uh, what can you tell us about it? I'm very biased. <laughs> <laughs> having a problem with it. <laughs> Just, you can leave yeah. it up press. Just leave it, yeah. Okay. Um, you're providing jobs. As my father used to always say, if you provide someone an occupation to make a living, you're already at, 
you're almost halfway there. And the thing about us is that we've been Teamsters for well over 60 years. But the thing about it is we provide pension through the, through the union and we provide health care. How could I deny anyone that? I can't because I have to live with myself and that's the way my father always thought. So we've been blessed that uh, it's a partnership and you know the rules and uh, we abide by the rules and, uh, and service is the key and uh, when my father was coming up we people when we were in the moving business the household moving business what we did was I should say my father did we used to move all the pianos for, for uh, the pops, Tanglewood, and we'd go up there and, with a gang of guys and move them all around for Leonard Bernstein and everything. And my father found a niche, the fact that no one wants to move pianos. So everyone <laughs> used to call us. Yes. And that was our niche. We did that for a long time. In fact, uh, Commissioner uh, Cameron was saying, uh, how's your golf game? <laughs> I don't have one because of my knees, because of all those pianos I moved. <laughs> you know, when I tell folks how many pianos I used to move a day, 20, they look at me like, hey, come on. We'd, we'd, we'd do a pick and pick up the piano, put it on the dolly, take it off the dolly, put it on the truck, and do the absolute reverse before we even get to the store of Baldwin or Symphony Hall. So actually, it's a little bit more than 20 pianos a day, but the body's not designed for that. <laughs> so, but I do it all over again because I did it to provide a living for my family. And that's what counts. At the end of the day, everybody wants the same things. They want to take care of their family. So I, I just, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed the casino. Uh, I'm not a gambler, <laughs> so. <laughs> but uh, the restaurants, uh, fabulous. <laughs> the steak was unbelievable. And uh, Frank Sinatra, I'm into that. I really enjoyed that. But the diversity, the people from all different countries, I was so proud that, that and I talked to them, you know, and uh, it was a delightful weekend, and I'm going to be back. <laughs> thank you. I, I want to uh, I want to just thank Director Griffin, and I know she had a, some help from uh, from Bill Curtis, and giving us the opportunity to recognize uh, not only the amazing history of the company, but uh, uh, how you've benefited from the introduction of gaming in Massachusetts. Um, we used to have a piano in my house. I should have called you. Because <laughs> the last firm we hired was excited until my wife told us, oh, yeah, the piano, piano is going up on the second floor. Um, but, it, I mean, I can't think of a finer example of what the gaming law was intended to do. It was intended to give local small businesses in Massachusetts the opportunity to partner with, you know, a nationally and internationally recognized company. And the legislation was so specific about that, and, and your company is a great example of how that success for the gaming statute is being realized. So thank you for that. I suspect that Jackie Crum was very excited when she learned about the expertise that you could provide in moving uh, the gaming tables. But I have to add one element. You said, and which is so true, and we all, hope we can share the same goal of 
providing for our family as the most the greatest priority. But just imagine how you've touched all of the Commonwealth, never mind areas around, by making sure that the music of the Pops the Symphony has been available to all of us. So, thank you. You know, they they couldn't do it without that piano. Oh. And so your knees, we're indebted to your <laughs> knees. <laughs> A, a remarkable fit that you were in Everett and available to move and and uh, and it's nice to give Bill and Jill credit, but I think uh, your history speaks for itself. So thank you and thank you for your thank service. you very much. Thank you. In closing, um, I just have it's to so tell exciting. the commission how I love digging into the history of this company. Um, um, mm -hmm. I learned that um, the pianos delivered included um, Arthur Fiedler, the late um, uh, Senator Brooke, um, Johnny Mathis, and um, Owens Moving also um, moved the first microwave oven from Raytheon, which was the size of a piano. It was not <laughs> the kind that you would imagine. <laughs> Probably a little more difficult. It was a macro oven. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, so that with the first casino um, in Greater Boston, I think they uh, have a history of uh, uh, making history there. Um, so anyway, um, thank you. Great. Thank you both. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Well, now we're moving on to item number six, and we have Mr. Curtis here, who's, who's just thanked by um, both Mr. Owens. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Jack. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. I, yeah. I was going to say, it is. It's going to. Nicest people. Oh. Nicest people. Yeah, we've, we've, um, we started out with two very um, positive reports and, and we're looking forward to yours as well. So thank you, Bill, and thank you, Encore. Okay, so today I'm joined with um, representatives is from your mic Boston Harbor, Jackie Crum, Senior Vice President, General Counsel. Bill, is your Bill. mic on? You Turn your mic on. Oh, sorry. Oh. And uh, Warren Richards, Executive Director of Food and Beverage. Um, we're here before you do to amend the original gaming beverage license application and presentation that the commission approved on May 22nd, 2019. Today for consideration and vote are three separate amendment requests to this original application. The amendment requests have been submitted on the commission form as prescribed under the 205 CMR 136.04 parentheses two. The applications are required to contain the following information. Floor plan showing the location of the area within the gaming establishment description of the licensed area, including the location of the dispensing areas, exits, and bottle service, description of the manner in which alcoholic beverages are stored and secured, description of the business concept, business hours, and the identity of the manager. Upon initial review of these applications by the Division of Licensing, deficiencies were noted and the applications were deemed incomplete. As per, as per 205 CMR 136.03, parentheses two, Modifications were then requested to bring the forms into compliance with the above requirements. Revised applications have been received, reviewed, and found to now be in full conformance with 205 CMR 136.04 and MGL Chapter 23K, Subsection 26. I want to give you a high level view of each request, and then I would ask the representatives from Encore Boston Harbor to explain these amendments further as they present additional information in their PowerPoint presentation. So the first amendment would be additional storage for alcohol. This amendment requests eight additional storage areas for alcoholic beverages. Currently, surplus alcohol is stored in four locations. The four locations being um, three on the, the ground floor would be the, wet, uh, the warehouse, the liquor pump room, and the banquet pantry, and on the third floor, the liquor pump room. The additional storage will be on the first and second floor with identifiable numbers on the doors of the seven storage areas. The eighth storage area is for Fratelli's Restaurant, a vendor to Encore Boston Harbor. The storage area will be located in the back of the house hallway adjacent to Fratelli's outer wall. 
liquor storage will be in locked liquor cages. <coughs> the second amendment is for additional alcohol beverage outlet. This amendment re requests an additional alcohol beverage outlet location to be called Salon Privé. Very good. Salon Privé, a VIP lounge located on the second floor in the high limit area. Access to the lounge will be by card or by invitation. There will be lounge seating for 30 guests. Licensed employees will serve alcoholic beverage during the hours of 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. Encore has represented that there will be an employee in the lounge at all times. Alcohol storage will either be in, will be stored in either, um, excuse me, Salon Privé Law credenzas or the back of the house. And their third and final amendment is change in description of a licensed area. This amendment requests to convert the preparation of alcoholic drinks for the casino beverage service area from bartenders to Easy Bar self-service towers. The Easy Bar self-storage tower will be operated by a cocktail server. So it's really not someone who goes in and makes their own drink. This conversion will take place in the casino beverage service areas numbers one through six and number eight. Casino beverage service in area number seven will remain the same. Alcoholic drinks will be prepared by the bartender. A total of 28 Easy Bars have slash will be installed with four Easy Bar, Easy Bar towers in each casino beverage service area. At the time of our inspection, I went out there with Lisa Brooker and myself and um, you know, checked out what they were doing. Um, not all installation was complete at that time. In the hours of the alcoholic beverage service will remain unchanged from 8 a.m. to 4 a.m., but only actively gaming patrons on the gaming floor will have the, have the service from 2 to 4. I would ask that if the amendments are approved, that Encore review their internal controls for alcoholic beverages so any changes are reflected in their internal controls, any of these amendments that, if they're approved. So I would ask Jackie just to run through the, the Encore presentation. Um, how do you do? I'm actually going to turn it over to Warren, who's the expert on this. <clears throat> so as you can imagine, we um, essentially have seven months of, of data and uh, information about the flow of patrons through the building. And that led us to uh, make these adjustments based on the demands of the various areas. Uh, one of the things that we learned very quickly um, in the first two weeks of opening was just how busy the facility was on the weekends. And essentially, uh, storage areas which we had um, outlined in the, in the design of the building uh, were beyond capacity on, for instance, Friday and Saturday night especially and that was causing us uh, a huge amount of, of difficulty in running the operation and uh, you know, pulls from the warehouse um, after hours, times which were, were very inconvenient to everyone involved, and it was slowing down our service to the guests. So um, a lot of the um, storage area changes that, that are reflected here uh, are to do with that exactly. Um, in this first instance, Sinatra, Sinatra actually is an area um, that is not accessible through back of house areas. You actually have to cross a guest um, esplanade to get to Sinatra. So this was definitely one of the areas where we probably undervalued storage in the original design. And the area that is, um, sorry, you can go back one. The area that's identified there is actually um, an area which um, is just across that hallway and we've installed um, cages there and uh, just allows us the extra capacity to store wine and, and some spirits in that area. All of the areas that uh, you see here um, either have or will have installed 24-hour surveillance and RFID access to these spaces. Uh, this space is an example of one that is completed and both are installed and uh, the only people with access to this space would be through RFID. Uh, the next space is um, a bar porter support room, um, originally something that we intended purely to store um, paper goods and supplies in, uh, we realized again would be a, a nice place to uh, add additional alcohol storage. This is um, actually quite close to pump room one and the warehouse on the first floor. So again, from a logistics perspective, it made a lot of sense for us to use this underutilized space, um, which was previously being stored cups and, and mops and uh, towels and things like that. 
uh, this space here, again, um, a space which was on the original master plan used for retail storage. Um, the retail footprint at that point included the spaces that are currently inhabited by restaurants. Uh, this storage space was never um, absorbed in those designs. It was retained by retail. And we would, again, use this opportunity uh, to add a storage area much closer to the restaurants, um, Sinatra, Oyster Bar, Red 8, and Waterfront. Those are the four restaurants that would be immediately impacted by this, as would the steakhouse. And this is the back corridor for uh, Fratelli. So this is the uh, main back of house area, uh, just up from the warehouse. Um, Fratelli, in the original master plan, was a restaurant that was actually going to be owned and operated by Encore. Uh, this was, uh, at a later date, uh, an outlet that then went to a third party. Frankly, Pasquale and Nick Verano. Because it was originally designed to be our outlet, uh, we did not build uh, back of house storage for this outlet that would be proportionate to the space, assuming that we would have daily drops coming from our warehouse. Now that it's a third party operator, they do not requisition it from our warehouse, and so they have uh, drops coming that are of size, as any independent freestanding restaurant would have. And so this has been the main reason for their challenges with storage. <coughs> Basically, we didn't build a restaurant with storage. Uh, the storage was the warehouse. So uh, there is nowhere other than that space delineated for them to, uh, to store products. This is not just alcohol. It's paper goods, cooking oil, um, all of those larger uh, sized items that need to come in on a, on a truck once or twice a week for them. Uh, this space is high traffic. It's just up from the warehouse and is under uh, plenty of surveillance uh, with a number of the things that are happening in that part of the building. Can you, do you have any pictures of what those cages are? Are they attached to the wall? Do they have wheels? Like, I'm they, having, I'm ha that's the one I'm having trouble with. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe there's one in the slideshow, but it is a, uh, a, a hard metal uh, wire cage on wheels. Uh, they're typically um, six feet uh, on wheels, and they're essentially uh, fill a six foot by three foot um, area with one or two shelves within. Uh, they are wired so that everyone can see the contents of what's inside, uh, so there can be no ambiguity as to what's being stored in there. And they all have um, padlock um, security on the outside, which only the operators of the venue uh, would have access to. But they're movable? They are movable, yes. And then you've got ramps that take you to what? So you've got the, your warehouse and what other access? It just seems like those are far too readily movable to really give me confidence in storage. Absolutely, when, and they can be attached. One of the reasons that they are not attached at the moment is just for the ease of cleaning the area, so those can be moved out of the way, but it can be, they can be fixed in place, and that could be an easy adjustment for us to make immediately. And does that cause any issues in terms of fire code or egress or anything like that? Uh, the width of this corridor, it is not an issue with um, ever fire and egress. So if they were fixed in place, it would still comply with all the requirements? That is correct. Bill, you did make, um, th this was the one that also caught my attention. You, you noted that this is considered an open location, whereas the remaining requested locations are behind closed doors. So the difference here is that for even the mini storage, nobody would actually know alcohol is stored behind those doors unless they had the information that is made public now. Correct. For these seven, um, I did ask Jackie if she could just affix numbers to the outside door instead mm -hmm. of putting a sign that said liquor storage. Good, and good idea. Things, you know, yeah. less, less, probable, less problems could occur. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, only probably upper management actually knows what the, what's behind those doors. Mm -hmm. And now to Commissioner O'Brien's concern, and what I'm hearing you, because we want to be practical, is that if you fix those, um, you wouldn't be able to clean as easily. Um, there's, that's why they're on no, wheels, or is there a reason why, I guess I'm wondering, is there a reason why you just didn't build, build storage with closed doors? Right. Why not just build out the hallway? Yeah, why not build the hallway out? What's, why the cages and why, is it just because it's so much and expense and it's clean I, and I, neat? Yeah, I think that this was, a, it, this has up to this point been a little bit of a moving target as to everyone normalizing their business. So this was originally done as a, uh, potentially interim or short-term solution, 
now we have a better idea of the, the long-term demands they have, um, we can investigate a more permanent um, solution here, but the, the current uh, storage that has been back there um, doesn't fill that entire green space. Um, they have at times stored um, additional chairs from their private dining room, for instance, in that space as well. So there's been a little bit of flux as to what is stored in the space, what isn't stored in the space. They essentially use it for any back of house staging currently. Mm -hmm. That can be anything from liquor stored in a metal cage to furniture to uh, a pallet of, of cooking supplies that, that may or may not have arrived. Um, so they're already storing liquor in cages? But not liquor, there? right? No liquor that, being That would be what would we would be proposing, oh, okay. yes. yes. They're, I, they're using I thought it, you said that yes. on occasion they would yes. have already done this. Yes, so this space out here is, um, it's been quite flexible in terms of how we would imagine them using it. Mm -hmm. And with it being a third party operator, we haven't yet um, suggested a permanent solution. Is, is the uh, notice from the diagram, uh, it appears you have a liquor storage kind of on the other side of the hallway. Is that sufficient for the two of you to share? Uh, Obviously with keys to your own cages, but access, but. That would be um, not impossible at all to investigate. We, that is where the um, pump room and all of the um, encore supplies go. So currently um, we've not wanted to, to share that space with, with a third party. Um, Given that they're not our employees, our mm -hmm. preference would not w mm -hmm. would be to uh, maintain separate access points. Right. Okay. I mean, I, I'd probably echo my colleagues. This is the, the one part of the request that concerns me the most, just mm -hmm. in terms of all the people you have moving up and down that mm -hmm. service corridor. Mm -hmm. Somebody from tel Fratelli's runs out, grabs a couple bottles, <coughs> doesn't have enough, you know, it's not an octopus, can't relock the door before they go back in. Mm -hmm. Just don't want to pose a risk of somebody mm -hmm. just happen to be passing by grabbing a couple extra bottles out of the cage. But so you did point out that it's all under surveillance, too. It's one yes. of the most heavily trafficked back of house uh, passages. So right. it's, it's under constant surveillance. Mm -hmm. Yes. Th that was actually one of the things that I think is for, from our perspective, a positive about this location, while not ideal, if this was on the third uh, floor, uh, for instance, and it was, you know, let's say outside of IT, and it therefore would have very little traffic from, you know, 5 p.m. through 9 a.m. on Monday morning, 5 p.m. Uh, on Friday through 9 a.m. on Monday morning. But this is a, uh, a high traffic area seven days a week, almost 24-7. So potentially a, a positive and a negative bundled into one. Uh, the uh, proposed first floor waterfront oyster storage refers to what was in the original plan a trash room uh, for uh, many of the es <coughs> Esplanade retail and restaurants. We have abandoned said plan for trash because it wasn't uh, really logistical. Trash now goes all the way to the back of the building making this space um, available for storage. Uh, we actually intend, uh, if approved, this to be a a uh, dual use space to allow us additional prep space for the oyster bar uh, so that we can maybe expand the menu offerings, some, some hot items, um, as well as for waterfront additional prep space for those two restaurants. Again, those were originally retail spaces, so kitchens are, are tight, and this will get us more flexibility. The long-term plan, of course, if this is approved, we would add potentially wine racks in here, uh, and this would be an RFID and surveillance uh, driven area for us to use. The um, second floor beverage storage, um, again, further continuation of, of the same theme, uh, a proxy location for additional beverage storage. Um, this space um, is right next to the stewarding warehouse and is already an RFID door and under surveillance. Uh, we had been using this for glassware recovery um, as we try to reunite glassware with its rightful owner in the building. Again, we don't think that that's necessarily uh, the most important use of this space, or at least splitting this space, again, gives us more flexibility. And similarly, this is a space that is on the third floor um, above, um, sorry, on the second floor above the steakhouse. Uh, steakhouse and the brew coffee shop, again, find themselves geographically quite a long way from the warehouse. 
Um, so again, from an operational perspective and uh, our ability to react, especially after hours during the dinner only restaurant period, um, this space here would give us that additional flexibility. Currently, um, again, storage for dry goods. And this is a proposed future storage area that is um, just behind the garden cafe and in-room dining room kitchen. Uh, again, similar theme to everything that we've been saying, bringing products closer for a proxy storage uh, to the back of an outlet such as garden cafe. That concludes all of the additional storage areas. Um, this is uh, the request for the conversion of what is existing, a uh, gaming salon. So the map here uh, indicates um, two gaming tables and some residential furniture. Uh, we believe that uh, following the launch of our um, tier card uh, for the uh, gaming guests, that our top tier of players uh, should have uh, somewhere to relax and take a time out and uh, this space in the high limit area lended itself very well. Uh, this salon is um, does not have a balcony view or anything of the casino so it uh, was quite underutilized and essentially the proposition um, is to uh, remove those tables, add some lounge furniture and have a uh, licensed employee provide beverage service to those guests during the uh, approved hours. Um, again, combination of um, small bites, uh, a croissant, a cup of coffee, potentially a glass of wine, uh, beer or a cocktail. Um, but this is really a, a, a lounge for a small amount of guests at a time, uh, 10 to 15 people just relaxing briefly. This is not a public venue um, showing the game and loud music or anything like that. It's, it's literally a VIP lounge um, just for those small subset of guests. Currently, I believe we have um, no more than 200 guests that are actually qualified for this lounge. We anticipate that group growing over time. But as you can imagine, the, the qualified guests that are on property at the exact same time is, is never going to be uh, a huge number. Um, and this space would be run um, when it is open with an employee always in the room because that caliber of guest, again, we would provide that service to them. So uh, there's no self-serve element there um, other than the, the food items if they wanted something to eat. Um, how, would, uh, um, how would somebody access that when it's, when it's open? Uh, sure. Is it carded or um, I'm just curious? So um, currently there is a host desk. Um, I don't know if you have that previous map. <clears throat> so um, I guess moving south on the map, um, where the corridor begins for the gaming area. Um, there's currently a control point right there where we have um, a rope and stanchion and signage stating um, essentially black card guests only. Um, and there's typically a red card attendant, uh, red, uh, sorry, I should say win rewards, sorry. Um, there is usually a, a representative from our um, tier card program that's there um, or a host at the desk itself. So uh, there's very little traffic through there that is not approved. Warren, could you mm -hmm. touch um, a little bit on the bottle service too, please? Sure. So um, bottle service, this mirrors. There's been no change here whatsoever to our original proposal. Uh, just thought a good opportunity to revisit it. Um, so we um, do not anticipate bottle service being a regular occurrence in that space. If so, we would follow the bottle service requirements. It would be under the control of a licensed employee at all times. The guests would never be permitted to serve themselves and um, uh, the bottle would never be unattended with the guests. So that would leave with the employee that poured it um, if there was a necessity for them to step away from the table. But just to be clear, we don't actually intend to sell bottles. There. No, we do not intend to sell uh, bottles. I added that to this area as we did for some of the other areas in the instance that we had a private event, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, um, for instance, we added bottle service to uh, many other areas in the original application. It was just for that one purpose. Uh, it's not part of our regular programming. This is a glass of wine, um, bottle of beer venue, uh, predominantly. Which would be complimentary to the guest. Yes. 
You, you quickly mentioned by invitation. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm assuming those are guests you're hoping to attract to? No, actually it's the guests that have qualified already mm -hmm. to be in okay. the highest tier of our newly uh, implemented tiered program. Okay, mm -hmm. that's correct. Uh, so this slide and um, the ones following refer to uh, casino beverage service. Um, we have, just as a recap, eight casino service bars that service the uh, casino floor. These are all behind the scenes service bars, nothing guest facing. Uh, there are six on the um, lower floor, uh, which is on the left, and there are two upstairs. One is in high limit, which is service bar number seven, and the other is service bar eight that's over in the poker room area. The next slides, and we can stay on this one just for a second, are um, closer looks at the inside of each of the bars. Um, we built bars um, in the traditional format here, so uh, typically uh, one service well to accommodate one bartender. Um, there are two bars on property which were built with two service wells, um, but the bulk of the casino floor bars downstairs only have one service well with one bartender, one speed rack, et cetera, et cetera, one ice well. Um, so if you're looking at service bar one, um, this would be an example. Um, the space in the bottom left corner, that's actually where the bartender would be standing, and the cocktail servers would approach from the other side. We have had uh, fairly uh, noticeable uh, feedback from our guests from day one about the speed of beverage service on the casino floor, it being one of our largest complaints. Um, I have had plenty of uh, opportunities to look at this process for the last six months and what we realized is it actually wasn't a lack of cocktail servers which is the usual um, suspicion it was actually the bottleneck um, that was happening in the service bars after they had taken the order so on a busy night you can imagine service bar one here having eight to ten uh, cocktail servers working from it in the existing and old model that is eight to 12 people approaching one bartender. And so what that was doing was, no matter how many cocktail servers we had, the snake waiting for the bartender was just getting longer and longer and longer as the bartender had to execute those drinks. So adopting the self-serve easy bar technology, uh, we actually are able to um, add four locations. This is the uh, self-service tower. We replace the bottleneck with four different places that someone can approach. So now you're taking eight and spreading them across four instead of eight and, and all going to one. So our hope, and uh, we believe this will be demonstrated quickly, is that this will, as much as four times, improve the speed of service going um, out to the casino floor. Now this is not because I'm going, trying to serve um, any faster than we originally had intended, but it means that the hour wait for a drink, which I have been uh, told has often been the case on peak, will shrink down to 40 minutes, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, which was our original target, uh, which we proposed, which was uh, a guest to be offered a beverage every 20 minutes if they so desired. Um, the terminal itself is um, not that dissimilar to, um, I think, a, an maybe an easy to visualize example here is if you've been to a quick serve restaurant where they have the very nice Coca-Cola or Pepsi um, touchscreen um, soda fountains, which have kind of taken the place of the, the old ones. The only difference here is this um, digital screen um, will allow you to pour whatever we program into it. So that can be a glass of wine, it can be uh, beer, it can be uh, a vodka soda, it can be a whiskey and Coke. Um, it's quite easy to navigate. Everything is categorized and organized. Um, the nice thing for the servers is we're able to add logos of um, brands and um, all the recipes are pre-programmed into the machine. It pulls from the pump rooms in the exact same way that what it replaced, which is in the bottom <coughs> right-hand corner, the gun that the bartender would previously press. So perhaps uh, one of the misperceptions about the old bar service is that the bartender was essentially ordering the drink through the gun. So we did not have these bars filled with, you know, 100 different bottles, and he wasn't free pouring uh, through jigger into a glass, actually, 
that much at all. It was uh, pre-programmed buttons that were in, in this case, a gun that now moves to a digital screen and the drink comes out dispensed from the screen itself. And in this but case, the beverage server mm -hmm. has his or her list, mm -hmm. comes in and touches the button and gets the cups and mm -hmm. puts so them on the tray and, con and continues to serve to go about doing the job. So it's actually a two-step process. Okay, uh, thank the you. The beverage server would come in, uh, run their card through our system the same way that they were doing before, mm -hmm. a different system than the Easy Bar. But they had to run a card to before? Correct. Absolutely. So it sort of opens up, essentially, the I Easy see Bar. The mm -hmm. They then move to the Easy Bar. And unlike a soda fountain mm -hmm. machine, these are all pre-measured pours. Mm -hmm. So they push the button, a pre-measured pour comes out, mm -hmm. and uh, it would only correspond to what they what they programmed in to the original order. Mm -hmm. But they're now grabbing the glass. They're they're taking they're pouring and they're putting on their trays and going back out. Correct. That is correct. And can you just explain? I'm sorry because I know there's so many questions in terms of the towers. How is this mm -hmm. going to help the the bottleneck? At the so instead of having the one bartender and all the cocktail mm -hmm. servers come up to the one bartender, mm -hmm. essentially each cocktail server will have their own easy bar. So they will have their own. More or less, more or less. So, so there are four there instead of one. Mm -hmm. uh, so they would come up, run their cards, move over to the easy bar, and be able to do those drinks. Mm -hmm. So a tower themselves. is like... That's the tower. One tower per, and then you have about four cocktail servers coming up. Right, so we've installed, uh, or four is the original install here for each bar. So that's the 28 count that was referenced previously, because we're only converting seven of the eight bars high limit, uh, which has a wider selection, including some premium spirits, that made this not really a, a, an applicable thing for service bar seven. So the other seven bars will have four towers. Um, so again, that, that lane of, of really, let's say, use the example of eight, you now have no more than two cocktail servers um, approaching one tower. Um, so it, it's four to one versus a one, uh, an eight to one uh, sorry, I said that wrong. It's a two to one ratio per terminal, whereas before essentially it was eight to one. Mm -hmm. um, have you had a chance to look at the comments here with regard to two different issues? One would be um, because of this, you will have more intoxicated patrons because they will get their drinks so, um, so rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, and the other comment really was about um, you know, not using bartenders. Um, and and I, I know that when we talked about this initially, that was not the case mm -hmm. with bartenders, but mm -hmm. um, those two issues were brought sure. up again. So the, the uh, speed of service is no different to our original application. What has happened is a gross amount of inefficiency in our original plan. So we have not, we wouldn't, we do not intend to add any more cocktail service to the floor. What we're trying to do is time them correctly based on our original plan. In the original um, uh, process, we intentionally spaced and trained to a speed of no more than three drinks per person uh, per hour. So once every 20 minutes was our target, and that remains the same. There is no change to the pore size that we're attempting here. And one of the ways that we're pacing that, along with the training of the ladies, is the routes and the size of the sections that they're working. So essentially the process of covering an area that would be um, a typical section for a slot, uh, someone working in the slot section, they don't have the opportunity to get back any faster than they already were. What was happening um, currently in the current system is they would make their rounds, take their orders, and then essentially stand in a, in a traffic jam at the bar. Um, and so that's the inefficiency that we're looking to eradicate. We're not looking to speed up in any way uh, from our original pr proposal. Uh, this is just to remove that inefficiency. And the common um, comment that we're getting, and um, literally this morning I got the uh, social media report, I got the uh, uh, credit adjustment reports that we get every single day, which are logging complaints from our casino guests uh, that are on the gaming floor. And when it's busy, they're continually reporting uh, about an hour as a, as a typical time that they're not seeing somebody come to offer them a drink. Um, so that's where we're trying to, trying to improve that guest experience. Um, the other comment, um, 
That's be right. the loss of jobs for the loss bartenders. Mm -hmm. So fewer than 40 employees were actually uh, impacted by this change. Could um, you just say that again, please? I, I couldn't hear. Fewer than 40. Fewer than 40, 40. yes. Um, and we have, uh, in a very active process, been looking to uh, make sure that each and every one of those had the opportunity to find an opportunity elsewhere in the building. Uh, I and can I share the so as of this morning, uh, I can report that um, 30 of the um, what I show as 40 basically um, had been <coughs> placed in other uh, positions in the beverage department on property. Uh, so that means they took open positions that existed at the burger bar, waterfront steakhouse, wherever else it may be. Um, one of the uh, main areas for placement was actually in the exact same department they were already in, which was actually in the service bars. As you can imagine, when you switch um, over this process, it doesn't mean that you still don't need to stock the bars. <laughs> so um, a lot of them actually moved into a, um, a higher hourly rate position, um, stocking the bars with all of the product which uh, is now automated. So that was um, something that allowed us to place 30 of the uh, affected people. Four people have accepted a transfer to other departments in the building. Um, that could be hotel, surveillance, security, valet, um, any of the above. Again, any openings that were available were made available to the entire group. Um, there is one person who is undecided, and eight have um, made the decision to um, seek other opportunities outside of the building. Um, if those eight had chosen to stay, you mm -hmm. would have worked to place Absolutely. them as well? Absolutely. They were presented with um, opportunities as diverse as the open opportunities we had in the building. They were presented with the entire set. And as I'm sure you're all aware, there are plenty of other attractive opportunities in the city that we're competing against for talent. So uh, we saw some of the new openings here in the city. Davio's just opened in the seaport, um, a big 300-seat restaurant, I believe. Um, and so. You know, that's just one example of um, ongoing opportunities there are in the city that, that people have, um, in some cases, taken. Um, everybody that is uh, choosing to leave is very much eligible to return if they decide that there's an opportunity for them to come back or if they left and, um, you know, something wasn't to, to their liking and they wanted to return. Everyone is leaving um, in, as far as I'm concerned, great, uh, great terms. And if they want to have a future with Encore, we'd be happy to have them. And just one, one more clarification on the bartenders and the uh, cocktail servers, the change from bartenders to cocktail servers. All of those employees are certified uh, in terms of the TIPS training, mm -hmm. so they all have that same certification. Mm -hmm. And did the servers who are, whose positions are being eliminated, in addition to the hourly rate, did they also get TIPS? So were they moving into a non-TIP job the when they... bartenders that were, um, the casino service bartenders that were affected uh, would receive a uh, tip from the cocktail servers. So that was part of their, the economics of their decision. Um, moving into a bar porter position, which is the stocker, um, they are paid a higher hourly rate because it's a non-tip position. Non -tip. But still the discretion of the cocktail servers in the same way it was as the bartender. Mm -hmm. um, they all had the opportunity to apply for positions, um, both tipped and non-tip, that were open in, in the building. So I'm almost 100% sure that one of the bartenders is going to be a guest-facing bartender now at On Deck Burger Bar um, up on the, the balcony. So that would be a tip position and hopefully a, a, a great and lucrative position because the On Deck is very busy always. So that would be just one example. Okay. I think we've Uh, and just to yeah. clarify, the, uh, the, the service between 2 and 4 a.m. remains unchanged. It's just, mm -hmm. just the process behind the mm -hmm. uh, service. Yes, actually, if you just want to rewind two steps there, one more. So this was the original submitted process, and the two highlighted bullet points just separate what was won previously. So this just differentiates service that's happening in the seven of eight bars, and then the eighth bar, which is in high limit, which is um, service bar seven, that's actually the um, terminology from the original application. Um, in terms of control, um, which I'm sure is an important point just to, to revisit here, 
Um, this is technology driven. Um, access to the towers to open it up, unlock it, is only done through employee swipe. Um, and we have the ability to shut down these um, towers for categories of product, alcohol in this case, um, electronically. So at four o'clock in the morning, um, if you attempt to order beer or wine, it essentially locks you out um, as just an unavailable item. Um, the towers remain at that point open for Coca-Cola, Sprite, non-alcoholic beverage. Um, so the towers do remain on, but the categories of alcohol um, are all blocked out and, and unavailable for use. And we can't change that locally. We can't mm -hmm. ever ride that locally. It has to be done through the uh, uh, mm -hmm. programmer or through yes. Las Vegas. Our programmer in Las Vegas, um, uh, so. Monday through Friday, um, 9 to 5, she is um, responsible for that programming, and that's not someone locally here in Massachusetts. I thought that was an interesting control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You have to wake somebody up in Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions for uh, Bill, uh, Jackie, or Warren? Uh, going back to Fratelli's, what are they doing now in terms of their storage, their alcohol storage? Uh, an alcohol storage. It's it's untidy back there. We have um, that back hole is is a daily struggle for us to get them to receive the product into the venue and put it away correctly. Um, so this is a this is a daily struggle for us. Um, to be honest, with all things, both alcohol and non-alcohol, that is a high traffic area, and we are looking for a sustainable solution. Um, that we can implement ASAP. So if a recommendation were to come from here that the cages be affixed and say a six month period of review where mm -hmm. you continue to look for other options, is that something that addresses the immediate issue that you're having with Fratelli's not taking delivery into the secure space in their restaurant? Are you referring to a, another space somewhere else on the property? Or building out that yep. hallway, yep. Fratelli's looking at their seating design to mm -hmm. say, okay, if we want to continue this and it's got to come in house, maybe they have to reconfigure some of the seating, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. We would continue to look for a different solution, potentially a, a, an area that's not in the hall. Um, <clears throat> There aren't a lot of spaces left in the building that are that are unassigned space, um, but we'll absolutely look to continue to, to find one if this is not the long-term solution. And as far as affixing them, that can be done this week. That would yeah, I think issue. that was more your point, the, the fixing, wasn't it? I, I still have concerns about open cages being in a high traffic area that close mm -hmm. to egress points outside. That still makes me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, the affixing is my most immediate objection, mm -hmm. where there's no way I would say that's okay. Oh. That, to me, resolves what was my immediate concern. I still am a little uncomfortable with that as a long-term solution, mm -hmm. which is why what I'm proposing is affix them and have the, have the approval go for a six-month period with the understanding you're going to come back and look. Licensing and enforcement can also talk about have there been any issues or is it fine to have it affixed and it's secu sufficiently secure. That's sort of where I'm leaning right now. Is the concern the cages, or if it was a more built-in structure, would that give you more comfort? That would that? give me less pause, yes, if it were. I, I think the, if, even the comment of numbering the doors as opposed to labeling them, and now you have mm -hmm. cages in a high traffic area with two egress mm -hmm. points. With alcohol showing. Is, is that what you right. just said, Jackie? Yeah, I wasn't sure. Right, so to if, have if, built -in a, cabinets. if it was a more <laughs> built-in structure so that the alcohol wouldn't be visible from the uh, outside. Right. And not movable. Is it the right. only place where the alcohol is visible, or is, is that a common, is that a practice where they use cages, Bill? Have you seen that? I've seen them <clears throat> being used at MGM, but that's just to take the stock off of the shelves in the bar, load it onto the, uh, lock it into the cage, and then bring it into the back room, wheel it into the back room. So For transportation. Correct. I correct. see. So, oh, okay. we do use we do use quite a bit of cages for lockup, mm -hmm. but they're usually in an enclosed space. Right. They're in it's an double, enclosed yeah. space, so I understand. Yeah. But they're they're mobile for a reason, and right. so that's why you have them. Okay. For instance, in pump room one, which is right next to that, there are cages like this inside that, yes. which 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 house our premium stock. So even though that's a controlled room, we want that added level of control uh, for for access to anything over $100, for instance. And that was yep. space that was designated as part of the license for? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
<coughs> so this, this is something I learned uh, today, until today. So they, um, Fratelli's, as a vendor, they bring in their own supplies, including alcohol and, and all their supplies, uh, right? And, so and they food don't and beverage. Everybody Everything is, you know, yes. they they contract, they admit yes. delivery. We and we then didn't. They need storage. That's correct. We didn't want to give. We didn't, as Jackie kind of referenced. We wanted to make sure that their employees were handling their product, mm -hmm. and would have no reason to be in our warehouse, for instance. Um, especially not in our alcohol areas. So this was just the cleanest way to do it. Um, they make their own deals with, uh, with Martinetti and Horizon and all of our beverage suppliers. Um, it's very separate to ours. And that's so, the same for Memoir and Mystique as well? That is correct. The so, difference there being that they were, we knew they were going to be outside vendors mm -hmm. to begin with, so the space was designed mm -hmm. differently. Correct. Right. So legally the license ex is through you, but then it, through an agency or some kind of arrangement, they have to comply with all of our rules. That's I correct. should understand it's a, it's that a better. Responsible, co-responsible person. It, it pretty much runs from the ABCC. Um, Is that how it works? Correct. I mean, you can't. They can't purchase alcohol and give it to someone else because yeah. it's invoiced to Encore, so <coughs> Encore has to sell it. Um, Fratelli, in order for them to get their first delivery, they had to send a copy over of their license. And what the, like, Montanetti would do is they'd jot down their information, and the billing is directed to um, Fratelli as well as Big Night Entertainment, which runs Memoir and Mystique. It's a state law that um, they only can deliver to an active license and only to that wonder. group. Mm -hmm. I think just to clarify, so the Fratelli license is an ABCC license. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. 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 <coughs> We so it derives from so the license that comes from right. us, but in they, terms they, of the execution, it's delivered and billed directly to them mm -hmm. to right. deal with ABCC's rights. Right. They're a jointly responsible party. Yes. And just to clarify, Thank it you. doesn't run through ABCC at all. It all runs yeah. through us. There's one, alcohol, there's one, what they call a gaming beverage license under Chapter 23K, which the commission issues. We have a provision in the regs that we refer to as a jointly responsible party. The uh, gaming licensee is ultimately responsible for all of the alcoholic beverage service in the building, but they're allowed to have someone else run a, a, a one up a restaurant or bar or what have you. Um, but it has to be done that the ABCC reference comes to the fact that those regs overlay us. There's so no the, when no, it's just, not allowed to the, then sell directly. The ABCC has nothing to do with this at all, except for the fact that a distributor. Right, can't it go. Has to, to deliver right. to a licensed entity, essentially. But we al we have a regulation that requires um, all alcoholic beverages to be received from a licensed distributor under Chapter 138. But otherwise, the Gaming Commission controls all the alcoholic beverage service in the casino. And, and they understand that you hold the license, and they they um, have to comply with your internal mm -hmm. policies. Absolutely. Yes, yes, we send them notices quite frequently mm -hmm. about not just that. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that said, we want to make sure that this is all nice and secure. Um, well, to um, address Commissioner O'Brien's mm -hmm. concern, it sounds like the uh, the easy. Um, a way to move forward is to fix the um, fix the cages. I would say uh, fix the cages with the understanding that this is a six month review. Mm -hmm. Is there something even more secure? I mean, your point about not labeling alcohol behind the door and that even your premium liquor is sort of double protected with cages mm -hmm. within closed spaces mm -hmm. so that you don't have this visible area in a high traffic area near egress mm -hmm. points. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do think as a, as a short term solution, mm -hmm. it helps what is already an issue for mm -hmm. you guys, but I do think it mm -hmm. should be continued to be looked at to say this should be more secure and not visible to people. And potentially with the approval of the other um, storage areas, we'll be able to look at Encore um, storage as a whole, and potentially there would be a space that would reveal itself for Fratelli. Obviously, logistically, we want them to be as close to right. their restaurant as possible. Um, going back to the original design, Pump Room 1, if we had been running Fratelli this whole time, it would have been a whole different story. It would have been right there. It's actually the reason that alcohol storage wasn't sufficient, because we anticipated them, uh, well, us, using our own storage area. It only became a challenge with the fact that it became a third party. And we want to make sure not to handicap Fratelli's. We want them to be successful here. 
um, you know. Uh, so <clears throat> the mother in me is concerned about cleaning under those cages if we <laughs> fix them. That's why walls also sell, solves that problem too. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I think the cages are slightly off the floor. If I'm they are there. So I we think can't uh, get under there. <laughs> yeah, there I'm feeling better wheels. already. They're on wheels. Uh, They're on wheels. Yeah. <laughs> As a dad, I don't care about cleaning, but yeah. um, I, 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 I do appreciate the recommendation to try out of fixing the cages and see if we can come up with a better solution. So with that said, um, why, don't we, why don't we tackle first the request around the easy bar, self-service. Are there any more questions with respect to that license amendment? That's a license amendment as well. Yeah, I, so I, they're I, all license amendments, yeah. I just had a general question by, by removing a uh, person who's back there full time what safeguards do you have to make sure people aren't just wandering in off the floor? Give me an idea of how that wouldn't happen. Well, e even if they did wander in off the floor, they wouldn't be able to access any alcohol. So they'd have to slide their employee right. card through, and then mm -hmm. the easy bar doesn't open until they've gone through that process. Mm -hmm. And you don't keep anything else back there that it's, well, so, somebody so would want to rifle through? Yeah, so actually an interesting point. In, in the old model uh, with the guns, I would say that 85% probably of, of all drinks um, was through the gun, but there was still a speed rack that would have those one-off things for the person that wanted something with blue curacao or, you know, peach schnapps or something that wouldn't go through the gun. Um, in this new tower, those items now actually live um, locked and they are all running through because um, we had to replace the bartender. So. There is nothing now that doesn't go through the tower itself, so there is actually no bottles loose anywhere that are not locked up. Um, it's all coming from behind the scenes or locked in cabinet now, so that's that's a big positive. Plus, we anticipate having the bar porter um, in the bar at all times, um, cleaning, restocking glassware, ice, and all of the maintenance of the bar, cleanliness, all of the above. So. Um, we believe the, uh, the bar is actually going to be uh, attended by an employee at all times. Um, and to Jackie's point, there's actually nothing that's accessible to them other than non-alcoholic beverage, even if they were to find their way in there. So there's a bar porter who does the cleaning and the stocking mm -hmm. of non-alcoholic. Um, uh, of, of everything that's in everything. the bar. Yes. They are also yes. um, authorized to go to the additional storage areas and get Exactly. Uh, whatever they need for Exactly. Uh, yes. That person that's isn't the same able person. To, and that. that's the job that I think I heard. Did I hear only one person took that elevated job? Or, or uh, no. Uh, there's one undecided. There was, there was just okay, one person well, undecided, okay. still, still decided. Is this the first time for the company to use these uh, Easy Bar self service towers? I know other casinos do use them, but is this the first for your company? So we, we actually had. Um, had a couple of them installed um, since the opening for non-alcoholic beverage services and experiment only. So the technology is not actually brand new to us. Um, we've, we have had them, and the intention there was that on the overnight shift when we're not um, serving any alcoholic beverage, essentially the need for a bartender was potentially redundant because they would just be standing there. So that's why we had installed them. We've never used them um, at Wynn Resorts until um, hopefully now, um, but we researched very heavily um, other casino companies, both in Las Vegas and outside of Las Vegas, um, and we took great feedback from those operators, um, and I think unanimously they felt that it had the positive impacts that we described earlier, um, and they were happy from a control perspective. Um, but also uh, accuracy of pour and taking the, the human error element out um, ha has been, I think, a, a widely accepted plus side to the system. And that's also what MGM and PPC have. Yeah, I realized that, but I just didn't know if that company. Yeah, no, from the company, yeah. That's a mm -hmm. Any further questions? Yeah, on the Easy Bar self-service amendment? proposal. 
With that said, do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I will move that the Commission approve WinMass LLC request to use the Easy Bar self self-service tower in their service bar numbers one through six and number eight in accordance with the terms and conditions discussed here today. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Now moving on perhaps to the Salon Privé. I think uh, one clarification for me was that you will probably not have the bottle, it will not be a practice to have the bottle service. Any further questions for Warren on Mr. Richards for on this matter? Do I have a motion? I, uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve Wynn Mass LLC's request to add a new licensed area referred to as Salon Privé as described on slide number 14 in the submitted PowerPoint pr uh, presentation in accordance with the terms and conditions discussed here today. Looks Second. like it might be 13 and 14, correct? I'll amend that to slide number 13 and 14 in the PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Mm -hmm. Five zero. Now moving on to the additional storage. <clears throat> so what I would, before we go to making formal motions, mm -hmm. uh, what I would be inclined to recommend is a motion that um, looks at approval for the seven of the eight requested, but specifically as to number four, that it be approved for a six month period um, with the condition that the cages be locked and that prior to the end of that six month period, both um, IEB and or licensing, whoever has looked at that and the, the licensee come back um, for just a review of whether that can be improved in terms of the visibility and the egress in that hallway. Fixed. Yes, I think the they're divinity. already locked, but yeah, they would be fixed. Fixed. Yeah. fixed. Mm -hmm. Mr. That would Gross, be my inclination. Mr. Grossman, is there any issue with respect to, it's not, con well, the condition would be we'd like them fixed now and, and we, then we would uh, issue the certificate rather than conditioning the Correct. certificate. They'd have to be affixed first. You'd we'd have to go out yes. look at it and You'd go then out. we'd issue the license. I think that's fine. And then a six month review we'll and, six and months barring any big it. issues, we won't need to have it come in front of us. Right. Correct? Or you'd have an update in it your might mind. Be. I, I would still like a discussion about the visibility, and maybe it's something that's resolved even prior to six months where they come back and say, this is how it is now, and there's no issues, then there's no reason. My goal is that after these approvals, and we can essentially move into our new homes, um, is that Encore, an approved space that Encore is currently using, I will vacate, and um, they will move into a, what will hopefully be an approved and surveilled and RFID access door just for them to use. The one which, again, I don't want to be over-promising, but one of the storage areas that um, is mm -hmm. just around the corner from this space, uh, if I can absorb into other areas, uh, that, that's the one that I would like to, to probably investigate first. But we will do a very diligent search immediately after locking these cages to the wall today. Uh, and we should be able to report back positive news well in advance of six months, but we, I think, Jackie would agree with me, I should probably take your generous offer of six months. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being Ms. responsive. To, Mr. To Richards you. has his, uh, his tool chest right behind him <laughs> with the drill. <laughs> so maybe we just split um, the we motion. Could do two we could do two motions. We can do two motions for seven and then for... You could do um, one. one through three and five through eight. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll, I'll move that the Commission approve WinMass LLC request to add seven new alcoholic beverage storage areas as depicted on slides number four and labeled one through three and five through eight, submitted in the PowerPoint presentation in accordance with the terms discussed here today. Second. Any further questions? 
All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Do you want to make the motion on sure. number four, Commissioner? Yep. Or? And finally, uh, I move the commission uh, approve subject to confirmation of the cages being locked. Um, you mean fixed? Fixed. Okay. Um, the storage beverage area that is referenced on slide four of the PowerPoint today, um, it bulleted as number four outside Fratelli's um, with the further understanding that at, on or before six months from today's date that a review will be done in terms of the visibility and the storage uh, of that location. Second. Any further questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Five zero. Excellent. Thank you so much for your patience with all our questions. We appreciate it. Thank you, Bill, for an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do lunch before John. Before we um, advance on our agenda, um, Mr. Ziemba, are you available if we were to have our lunch now? Would you be available this afternoon? Absolutely. Okay, then um, we ask for a break of one half hour. Does that work? Mm -hmm. And we'll return at, at one o'clock.
Good afternoon. We're reconvening meeting 289 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Ombudsman Ziamba. Item number seven, please. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Uh, for the afternoon matters, I'm joined by Director Griffin and Construction Project Oversight Manager uh, Joe Delaney. The first item up for consideration is the development of a new template uh, format for the quarterly <coughs> reports. Um, some time ago, the Commission requested staff to take another look at our quarterly reports that each licensees are required to make. Uh, it's been a good number of years uh, since we established the format of the quarterly reports when Plain Ridge Park first opened. Uh, we've been utilizing that as basically the roadmap for all of the subsequent MGM Springfield reports and then most recently now that Encore has a, um, uh, at least one operational report under its belt for Encore as well. So in order to uh, try to determine what we should think about for the quarterly reports, uh, staff met together uh, a few different times. Uh, we met individually with commissioners and we had some conversations as well with our licensees. Um, so what you have before you is uh, some overall goals uh, of, of the quarterly reports and some recommendations. But I think overall what our recommendation is is that uh, once the commission has time to discuss some of these more amorphous general goals, uh, that then staff can go back uh, to our licensees with the nuts and the bolts and actually crafting a very concrete template form, a report that would come to the commission um, quarter after quarter. Um, so with that, let me just dive into some of the goals that, that we heard in all of these conversations. Um, one of the goals was just a general consistency of reporting data uh, between and among all licensees. Now, they, they are all different, uh, of course, but for the most part, some of these statistics can uh, just be um, pretty much across the board. We can require a more consistent format on how things are reported. Uh, one of the other goals is more precise information on the achievement of diversity requirements. I'll get into that in a little bit. <coughs> Clearer comparisons between current quarter statistics and historical statistics. Clearer display of statistics versus relevant goals. More information showing the development impacts that are occurring in the gaming licensees communities. Continued focus not only on the prior quarter, but also current period issues. Uh, refinement of reporting to help the commission achieve its mission while reducing unnecessary regulatory burdens on staff and licensees. The use of quarterly reporting as a method to ensure compliance. And then more uh, definition, differentiating information that is part of a presentation versus part of a PowerPoint. Uh, at the center of the recommendations, what we are uh, we're, we're recommending is that we would like to go back uh, to where we used to be. During the construction period, we used to have a system where we had a report and then we had a companion PowerPoint. And all of the relevant statistics were included in this, in this report. And so what we, would, uh, what we think we should do is that we should go back uh, to the way that it used to be done so that uh, everything in all the more concrete, finite detail can be in this report. And then when the commissioners, excuse me, when the licensees report to the commission, their PowerPoints, the PowerPoints can be a little bit, um, they'll, they'll include all of, all of the relevant topical uh, stuff of the day. Uh, they'll try to include most of the material matters that uh, we're accustomed to and seeing from the Plain Ridge report on, but there can be a lot more detail included in, the, in, these, in these templates that will look the same uh, licensee by licensee by licensee. Um, one of the other recommendations is uh, when we were thinking about this as a tool for compliance, when indeed it is, uh, appearing before the commission and explaining how the statistics are going between one uh, period and, and another and versus goals, it is a way to help achieve compliance with a, a good number of things. Now, when you take a look at the reports as they were developed, there was an initial focus on minors and the gaming floor for Plain Ridge Park. And then as we moved on to MGM Springfield, that continued to be a concern. And then indeed, as we're uh, looking at the Encore data, it continues to be something that we want to take a look at. But obviously that is just only one compliance item. So uh, we were trying to figure out what we should do. That is one important compliance item, and we imagine that that would uh, 
probably appear before the commission for the foreseeable future, but there's a great many other compliance items that could be reviewed by the commission. And so uh, what we're recommending is instead of trying to put every compliance item or every uh, matter in all of our various departments in these reports, that we would have to develop a more concrete system to flag issues that are of concern uh, that might become problems or might become problems in the future or just items where our licensees are really doing a good job at compliance and that we would bring uh, individual items to the commission at different uh, quarterly reports. But it wouldn't be a laundry list of every particular compliance item because that would become <coughs> a little too unwieldy uh, and it may not serve the purpose of focusing the commission on some of these other items. Now that uh, involves a, a good deal of communications between uh, commission meetings but with uh, an overall focus that uh, we're trying to achieve on compliance and greater co cooperation between and among all of the various divisions, um, I think that that, that probably will, um, uh, that will grow to be a, one of the most valuable parts of this uh, endeavor. Um, we want to include that the, so in the, the PowerPoint, as I mentioned, it'll be a little bit of a looser construct. The, the template report we want to make sure that the template can show statistics of prior quarters. Uh, we still have to determine how many prior quarters we would recommend for that template. But right now, uh, depending on the month or the report, sometimes you just may only have current data and you have to leaf back to your quarterly report that you received in the prior quarter and another in your files to, to say how you're doing across quarters. But we think that that kind of detail, that could show up in this new template report and then the licensees could talk about material or significant um, diversions from trends in their PowerPoints. And of course, the commissioners would have those templates so that they, they would be able to see them on their own and, and question our licensees. But we would ask our licensees to continue to try to bring up si significant or material events in their PowerPoints themselves. Uh, but in general, when we looked at the PowerPoints, they do currently capture most of the important stuff that we really value. They, they include all the detail on, on uh, uh, how we've been doing on a quarter from revenues, what have we been doing on employment. They're, I think you know when we first came up with them, we hit it pretty close to correct on some of the important matters, and I think that's sort of served as well. Um, one thing we would also like to do is, in addition to just quarter to quarter statistics and historical statistics, that we could also have the goals uh, directly um, right there with the statistics. Sometimes it's not as easy as, as we think to find what the goals are. Uh, and we'd have to make sure that we work with our licensees to make sure that they agree that the goals are the goals um, and that they agree to those goals uh, when they put together their RFA2s and when we um, issue the licenses. Um, on more specific matters, the commission has asked for more detail on lottery information, we think that we can definitely do that. Uh, information regarding Keno, information regarding purchases of tickets, we think that that could go um, in the new template reports. Um, uh, I will, let me just turn it over to Director Griffin just really quickly. Um, but in general, what I wanted to say regarding vendor and employee information and diversity information, I think that you're all aware that uh, uh, Jill and Crystal, uh, Commissioner Stebbins, have been working for a good period of time to try to update some of those uh, some of those formats, and I think we're pretty pretty close uh, to finalizing it with the, with the licensees. We'll probably have one more round. Um, uh, Director Griffin and Jill have put together basically the templates that will be the example for the rest of the report. But um, I think we're looking pretty good there, and, and hopefully in very short order we can have those updates. Sure, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Bud, on Budsman Ziamba. Um, so the, um, we've been actually um, in conversations, I, I think since, um, I remember good weather, so maybe the summer, um, back and forth with <laughs> licensees and, and have um, um, uh, back and forth um, conversations and different versions and um, and really refining um, the templates um, regarding workforce and supplier diversity um, one of the changes that um, we are recommending 
is um, we'd like to have a snapshot of diversity by management level. Um, so how are um, employees um, uh, doing in terms of getting managerial or supervisor jobs? And so that is going to be one um, new recommendation um, that, that you'll hear more about. Um, but other, uh, other changes that um, we've talked about with John are <laughs> formatting, um, um, clarity, um, for example, um, um, being more inclusive, um, as he mentioned, about including the prior quarter's data so you can more easily compare, you know, the spend or um, um, the, the employee level, that sort of thing. Um, and just um, some of these um, changes came about as we were preparing for our annual report and um, comparing and noticing that the information wasn't quite apples to apples. And so that's um, what we're looking um, in terms of, um, for example, um, a chart regarding vendor spend and diversity would also include the total biddable spend that quarter. So it's easier to um, um, compare and check. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I, I think that is the general um, progress that we're interested in. And I think our licensees do very well at um, sharing whenever possible success stories, um, both um, the human element in terms of their employees and also the um, vendors as well. And combined with that, um, we'd like them to include um, um, plans for remediation should they not reach a goal. So. Moving on to the next recommendation to, to go from the more precise to a little bit more of the global. Um, one of our first meetings, um, we, we spent a good time with Elaine on what are some of the big goals that we want to achieve with these quarterly reports. And I think that part of the, part of the the usefulness of the quarterly reports can be conveying the message of what is happening not only within the walls of the facilities themselves, but what impacts are being felt in the communities. And we've talked about different measures such as hotel, restaurant taxes that we can definitely capture in the, in the templates. But what we want to do is we want to continue to work with our licensees to figure out how do we capture quarter to quarter some of the, uh, the greater impacts on the communities themselves. And I think in general, perhaps there's, maybe there's some uh, way that we can work with our researchers, because even though our researchers, they get out the reports when they can, when everything becomes um, statistically correct, et cetera, maybe there's some way that we can work with our researchers to get relevant statistics, work with our licensees so that you can get uh, some more up-to-date information on the impacts that are being felt in the communities themselves. But that's, uh, that's something I think that bears uh, a lot more thinking on how and what statistics and what types of things can we include in these quarterly reports. Um, we think that um, we should include some of our capital spending uh, requirements in the reports. How are they doing versus the capital reinvestment requirements? Um, and then we will continue to work with our licensees on a lot of the financial reporting. The financial reporting, by its necessity, it doesn't really uh, come into the commission uh, discussion because these are sort of detailed uh, financial um, statistics that, that, uh, that can't uh, be made public for various reasons. So we're going to try to continue to figure out how we get the best information at the property level without overburdening our licensees. We certainly have the availability of uh, SEC public reports. Uh, but there's different levels of reporting that go on for uh, each of our properties in those more roll, rolled up quarterly reports uh, or annual SEC reports of the, of the parent companies. 
um, that they each have different numbers of properties that are in their portfolio. But um, uh, this is one particular aspect that I, I think I mentioned that all staff is, uh, mo most of the departments are working together to try to figure out how do we make this work. And we've had some good conversations with our licensees on how to do that as well. Uh, and one final recommendation, and I think we've heard about this from Mark, is that even though we probably wouldn't require our licensees to do the reports on GameSense and others, that really should be a companion piece by Mark, we would encourage our licensees uh, to inco incorporate relevant information regarding responsible gaming activities in their reports or in their PowerPoints, but that the, the GameSense updates, that is probably more appropriate for not our licensees, but Mark, uh, when he comes quarterly before the commission. We welcome any thoughts. Uh, this, is, this is great that we're <clears throat> we've started this um, thought process of looking at, uh, you know, holistically and from different perspectives uh, as to what, what we really need to see in the, in the reports going forward. Um, and, you know, that Many, many things will probably stay, but others, you know, might change. Uh, I just want to pick up on um, one of the aspects that you mentioned, uh, and that is the notion that a lot of these helps uh, in terms of compliance with not only what they're required to do under conditions or the, of the license or what have you, but our own compliance, and this is something that uh, we've been giving it quite a bit of thought. Um, and um, there's also, and there, and there are, um, I'll also mention this. Um, there are some of those requirements that are annual yes. and others that are, you know, perhaps really lend themselves to being on an ongoing quarterly basis. So perhaps as we think about this uh, new format, we can, we can also think of the fourth quarter or the annual version of the, of the quarter uh, um, to include certain elements that are in addition to or, or that do not need to be reported quarterly but will accept on an annual basis because they're changing enough or not enough that they don't merit quarterly reporting but it's really appropriate not just for the period but for complying pur compliance purposes that they be reported annually. Um, I, I wouldn't want to create a fifth report and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking Maybe the fourth quarter report could be a compilation of um, of a, a few things that are not necessarily uh, reported uh, all the time. Um, not only would that help us with our own annual report, uh, but it could also really help with the comparison, uh, as you uh, with the with the statistics that you that you mentioned. Um, if we're looking at quarter over quarter, you know, on a quarterly historical. I think it, it also um, may be relevant to come to the annual anniversary to look at the prior years, wherever those may be, uh, and make a, 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 an annual comparison for that fourth quarter. Um, but I like the principles that you've outlined here. I, um, I, 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 I know the intention is not to make a lot more work that already is happening. Yeah. It's really trying to be creative on you know, what we want to see and we, when we want to see it, that also helps us um, on our own, for our own purposes. One thing um, I mentioned is one of the goals is this regulatory reform. And one of the questions that we asked our licensees, we didn't get, uh, we didn't get too much input as of yet, but we did say, hey, are there things that are particularly vexing that maybe you don't think uh, are worth uh, pulling together? And we can evaluate what those things may be. And when we take a look at reporting, there are things that we require every month. There's things that we require every couple months. There are things that we require quarterly. There are things that we require annually. And, you know, maybe we can take a look at what data do we need at what particular period of time mm -hmm. on a going forward basis as we mm -hmm. start to think about it. And um, uh, we may be able to help have tools to help on that exercise, too, as you pursue the regulatory reform so that we <coughs> assist the licensees through a proper form to prompt that review and, yeah. and without causing a lot of work to streamline the process a little bit. Yeah. So that's something to yep. think about. Yep. <clears throat> Again, and it providing some consistency for you know guidance on that. But 
He has his blue book. I have my blue book. <laughs> <laughs> the blue book is for the bag. <laughs> mm -hmm. She knows my system. Mm -hmm. So if there are no further questions, what we can do is that we can take this to the next level, uh, more uh, fully engage our licensees, more pen to paper on what these things will look like. Sometimes it's difficult to talk about things in general. If you have the specifics, it's a little bit easier to do on, you know, direct grip. Is, I is think really we have a few process. more questions. Commissioner Stebbins? Yeah. Um, sorry, John. Um, just, uh, just a couple of points, and in, in I thought the memo was well put together by, by you and your colleagues. Um, and, you know, if I, if, I always thought our licensee, Plain Ridge Park, did a great job. I know that's why you've included it as kind of a model as right. to uh, how we've successfully uh, extracted information quarter to quarter. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's important to remember that uh, quarterly, quarterly reports are a snapshot. They're meant to, you know, spot issues with our licensees if there are any. They're not meant to be, you know, put our licensees in a position of some type of gotcha moment. Um, but it's good information to tell a good story. It's good information to help us understand what the challenges are, uh, as well as, you know, for the for the folks that put this legislation together, there's a lot of information we collect that reflects back into what the priorities of the gaming statute were. Yeah. You know, no impact, no negative impact on, on the lottery, jobs, business opportunities. So collecting that information is key. Um, I think some of this, I know some of the stuff that, that Jill has already had a chance to talk about is critically important. I would like us to think about not only capturing the current quarter, or the most recently passed quarter, and maybe one or two before that, but trying to look at that same quarter the previous year. Um, if you agree with the argument that there is some seasonality mm -hmm. to the gaming industry in Massachusetts, it'd be interesting to look at that year previous um, and I like Commissioner Zuniga's point so maybe there's some things we can capture at the end of the year it might be more on the job front number of promotions that our licensees have given out that reflects a good story as to the opportunities uh, the number of people that we've helped catch on behalf of our friends at DOR um, so I, I like the idea of maybe having some kind of roll-ups at the end of the year of some of the other critical compliance or enforcement categories as well. I, um, I like that idea as well. I think it's a good one. And um, I like some of it. It's really apparent that you thought this through. Where do we get more value for these quarterly reports? And I liked a lot of the ideas. I don't know how happy they'll be to go diversity all the way up, Jill, but it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a point that I've asked about several times. So I think it's important because when you know you have to report on something, you just pay more attention, right? Exactly. We've had um, lots of conversations about this. Mm -hmm. And our licensees, if, if they're anything, are very cooperative. Mm -hmm. Any further questions for John, Joe, and Jill? Uh, an excellent, Jill. excellent report, thorough. Uh, um, <clears throat> Interim Executive Director Wells, I think that I, um, the, today's meeting, all of the reports have been so detailed and thorough and really helpful to me. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure my fellow commissioners agree, and this is just another great example, so thanks. Uh, in the best outcome, so I know how to say template. That's right. That's right. So thank you. And John, you're staying on now. Um, I, I don't see Mary. Mary is out today, um, and we all want to wish you or her a happy birthday. Yesterday oh. was, what, wait, wait, two, two days ago was, what, it was yesterday the 12th? So yesterday. Oh, yesterday as well. Yesterday was her birthday. <laughs> Uh, oh. But she's out for other reasons for, for today and a couple of days, so, so we, but, can, uh, we wish her happy birthday. Happy birthday, Mary Thurlow, and uh, great, great job on this report as well. 
All right, so uh, the good news, commissioners, is that I am not going to go into every one of the applications that we received. That is never the purpose of the intake meeting. I was uh, ready to go. To <laughs> Do you have another notebook? The, uh, the red yeah, notebook. Uh, yes. I think there's another fire yeah, but I have to here. say, it's exciting. Yes. There may be a lot of them, and it may have been torturous, but it's exciting news. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Um, so what we usually do in this first intake meeting is we just remind everybody of the process that we utilize to review the applications, give us sort of a general overview of what we received, um, and then we, then we start moving forward with the actual review. Uh, in regard to timetable, what we've been trying to do is we've been trying to get all of these awards done by the early part of June, if not May. I'm not sure we've really hit that um, in prior years because one thing or another really seems to um, surface. Uh, we're gonna redouble our efforts in that regard this year because it's helpful for communities and others to plan for their next fiscal year if they get earlier decisions. So we're gonna try to do that. But I don't have a specific timeline here, but that's what we're aiming to do. Uh, as you mentioned, we received a lot of applications. This year we received 36 applications totaling $13.4 million, uh, which is uh, the most that we have ever received. Um, it uh, is far greater than the number of applications and the dollar value that we received last year, which was about 5.1. And then the previous high was uh, $7.9 million in 2018 but that involved a one-time expense of state police costs. So that's what helped uh, add to that number that year. Um, so we added a new category of grants this year, which is transportation <coughs> construction grants. Uh, and we did receive a number of applications in that regard. Uh, but in general, I think that uh, one thing that the n number of applications is testament to is that all the work that we do, uh, all of us do, uh, every fall and in the spring to make sure the communities know what these grants are for, uh, that they can get ready, they can prepare to, to try to figure out what it will be in their applications. And it's quite clear that people are paying attention. So, uh, so we'll take a look at those. Um, so as for our review process, I think um, you're aware that we have a very highly interactive review process. So what we do is we assemble as a review team and uh, this year's review team will include at least the following members, Commissioner Stebbins, uh, uh, thank you once again, myself, Joe, Mary, uh, Mary Thurlow, Director Griffin, uh, Crystal Howard, Carrie Teresi, uh, uh, Kate uh, Muxie Hardigan, and um, Teresa Fiore is a new addition to our team this year. So uh, that review team, we assemble, uh, pretty routinely to go over the applications. What we're going to do is we're gonna to try to assign various applications and ask for different members to take the lead on assembling the paperwork this year. So what we do, the paperwork is pretty, uh, pretty intense. Uh, so what we have is a very detailed summary of all the grants and the issues. And we weigh those grants against the criteria that we put into the, uh, into the guidelines. And then we put together a summary memo which is usually about 40, 40 pages, so it's not much of a summary, but it is in comparison to the thousands of pages of materials that we review. And that goes to the commission um, you know, by May or June and for us all to review, including whatever conditions there may be. Uh, we always post our applications on our website. Uh, thanks to Elaine and Austin, those are already posted on our website. And fairly soon, we will issue a request for comments. And, uh, those comments are all distributed to the commissioners and they are reviewed by the review team. We do really value uh, those comments that we receive. So in addition, um, we also uh, solicit comments from our licensees, from regional planning agencies, and very specifically from um, MassDOT on all transportation related matters. Um, they have been invaluable to us in, in previous years and specifically now that we are moving into the construction function uh, I think they'll be even more valuable. Uh, we've already <coughs> done the outreach to them and hopefully we'll have a conversation with them soon about the applications and what do we do next. One thing while we're talking about transportation is that as a companion piece to this year's grant applications, we're going to issue a statement of, a request for statements of interest. 
So our transportation construction grants for this year, they're designed to be one-year grants. They're not designed for these rather large uh, transportation projects that may have a need for many years worth of funding because we could never fund a big transportation construction project through the revenues that we would have in any one year. Uh, but we will try to issue this uh, statement of interest, um, hopefully by the first half of this year, and so that we will be in a good place when we take another look at our guidelines uh, this fall uh, for final uh, review coming up in December. And so we'll know the universe of some of those bigger projects, what they're going to cost, what types of other financing is available. We'll gain some familiarity with it. So even though we won't award based on this statement of interest, we will get a lot of very detailed information that we can utilize in developing our guidelines. So um, one thing I will mention is that um, we did uh, receive that 13 plus million dollars worth of applications. Our program goal has been $11.5 million that we set. We still think that that is a reasonable goal. Um, but uh, I just caution because even though you may think of it the 13 million versus the 11.5, uh, because we've set regional targets based on the amount of revenues that we're receiving from each casino, whereby MGM dollars would be staying in Western Mass and uh, Encore dollars would be staying in Eastern Mass, um, it, it's not as close a match. For example, we received approximately $9.2 million in applications for Region A and that compares to a $6 million funding target. And we received about, about $3.9 million in applications for Region B versus a $5 million target. So we'll, we'll have to continue to take a look at that. And when we come back to the uh, commission, either a sort of a midterm update or when we get closer to the time of making our recommendations, uh, we'll take a look at both the overall amounts and funding amounts between and among all of the different categories of grants. So. Yeah, take any questions. Yeah, I can, I can just speak to that. Um, and I think that was a very helpful um, highlight of what dynamics are going to start to emerge um, in between the regions, which uh, I know you anticipated. And, yes. and there's something in the works relative to, after a three-year period, some kind of um, reversion back if there's unused monies right. that they revert back to the fund, if you will. Yep for future targets without precluding any one region from reapplying to something that emerges. Um, and that's something that, that, that will continue. But um, just back on the target, the overall target versus the application, and I'm really just um, glad, you know, I've read, I read the summary descriptions of, yeah. of, of, of the applications. Um, in, in, uh, as a whole, uh, it occurs to me that you know the target was appropriate and is doable, yes. and with the caveat of the regions, notwithstanding. Yeah. Um, because you know, unlike like in previous years, uh, there is people that tend to you know um, make uh, some requests that are less uh, uh, associated with the casino as as others. And as as you go through the review process, like I know you've done really diligently in the past. Um, it, it is quite possible that we might end up with, you know, very close to that uh, target. Uh, again, notwithstanding the differences between uh, between the regions. Um, and um, just just for reference, um, do you do you have an uh, uh, or can you can you come back in the next time to have like you've done in the past, um, sort of like a, a status of the of the overall fund as a whole that like, that can look back to how much. We've awarded what what is pending, um, and therefore, uh, with the projection uh, that we anticipate for this coming year, where do we end up with with the overall uh, target? Sure, Go ahead. maybe for next time. Yeah, looks like the review committee has its work cut out, right? Right. To meet those. Uh, Target uh, target goals there, but uh, it's certainly the committee's up to the task. Um, they've demonstrated that in the past, and it's always a thoughtful review. We, uh, I think you you both hit upon a big point. We have, we've allocated a big amount of dollars for these mm -hmm. grants, 
And if you're looking at the applications from the outside, oh, great, there's plenty of money. But in reality, we have the statutory responsibility that our funds can only be utilized for things that are related to the casino. Mm -hmm. And that av every single year of us being able to make that determination, so in good conscience we can uh, make that recommendation to you, that is the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. But Joe's in charge of that, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No. There. There are. Uh, you know. And 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 nobody can. Nobody blames uh, the local of officials from trying to advocate for their communities. Right. Uh, but there clearly is a uh, concentric circles effect uh, here, in which the relationship to the casino begins to, you know, fade. Fade. Yeah. Um, as you as you know in in some of these um, uh, topics. Right. You know. John, you touched briefly on the potential for the multi-year fine. Um, uh, yeah. I know at one point you mentioned that that could be a challenge for the recipients because of um, implications on finance. And, and is there, <clears throat> I know that that's down the road on your guidelines. Yeah. I just wondered if it made sense to, to maybe seek out any guidance from external um, experts on that so that when you do turn to that down the road, maybe closer in the fall, you'd have guidance, or are you already doing that, or? Yeah, one, uh, one thing that, that we benefit from, we have a lot of experts <coughs> that sit on our various committees, um, one of them being the subcommittee on community mitigation. And we started going to some of the difficulties of this multi-year financing, how municipal financing works, how when you, you might have to engage bond council to discuss some of these. And we had some very good recommendations for people that we should talk to uh, from uh, one of our members. Uh, and so we can engage them now well before the fall. Excellent, thank you. Any further questions for our community mitigation experts? The only other point um, which, which is good to see there's um, you know as, as we look back I think there's a um, um, there's an emerging um, trend clearly about you know who is applying for these uh, is proactively yeah. looking for things um, um, there's other available monies that are form part of the <laughs> equation here right uh, for example what is part of a host community or yep. surrounding community agreement um, that's right and, uh, and I think the myth, the, the, the process that you've really put together here in terms of the guidelines, the consultation uh, with the local, with the advisory committees and whatnot, I think is working out very well. Yeah. Um, and I think that's um, it's, it's good. With, well, uh, I think Katrina mentioned it this, this morning, but uh, you know, it's a pretty burdensome process, <laughs> right? And it's staff intensive and uh, you know, Mary, happy birthday, but he, he, she does, a lot of a lot of work on a lot of different matters and we're going to try to make sure that uh, we keep our workload within reason you know and so one of the one of the ways to do that is to maybe utilize some uh, some software uh, but uh, I'm very mindful I think most of you know me as being fairly cheap and I, I really don't <laughs> want to spend it, almost any dollars on this but to the extent that we can uh, and it would help us all I think that might make sense, but of course we would come to a recommendation mm -hmm. uh, to the commission before we move forward with anything. Yep. And I've said it before, it's a system that's, that others around the state might be interested in, in replicating, and, yep. and Director Griffin understands the implications of that um, in, with respect to her other work. So um, some <clears throat> using some technology to create those efficiencies could allow perhaps uh, uh, another group to replicate and scale it up accordingly so and or there may be some solutions out there that are already also potentially available to That's us right. mm -hmm. because they have done something similar yeah yeah we're, we're really looking at off the shelf rather than building our own <clears throat> any further questions no action needed so no action thank, needed. thank you so much Moving on to um, item number eight. This is <coughs> director. So the uh, 
there's a memorandum in your packet describing the process uh, that is uh, suggested for the commission's approval. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Attorney. Oh, no, I'm going to turn it over to Attorney Grossman to review that with you. See if you have any questions, and I believe uh, Commissioner Zuniga will ex expect to have some comments as well. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. We can um, jump right in. I just remind everyone, of course, that uh, the license that was awarded to Plainville Gaming and Redevelopment LLC is set to expire on June 24th of this year. That's their five-year uh, date from the commencement of their operations. Section 20F of Chapter 23K says that the Commission shall establish procedures for renewal. So we're here today to establish those procedures and commemorate them in writing. It's important, of course, that we do this um, so that everyone is clear as to what the process will be. A, that the Commission um, is, has been fair to the licensee and we put them on notice as to what will be expected of them, but also to help guide our efforts to make sure we're all on the same page as far as what type of information the Commission will be uh, looking to obtain. That said, uh, the draft you have before you is uh, simply a draft and we can and should make any modifications here today um, that would uh, accurately reflect the Commission's intention as to how the process will unfold. Of uh, specific note, there are a number of instances where we use the word may, the Commission may do this, the Commission may do that. Um, if there is consensus here today, we can change some of those mays into shalls. And then what the intention would be, um, if, if this makes sense, would be to take the Commission's decision relative to the process and commemorate it in a written letter to the licensee outlining all of the procedures um, and in, in earnest kick off the renewal procedure, uh, renewal process. So that, that's the, uh, the master plan. I'd be happy to now walk through uh, the proposal as outlined in the memo, if that would be helpful. Um, and if so, we can start uh, with section one, which talks about the application itself there is legal significance to the, an actual application, and though we don't have an application form, uh, it, it's important that an application be submitted. In this case, the application would be comprised of all the documents and other information that is submitted by the licensee for the Commission's review. The significance in part um, is that under Chapter 30A, Section 13, once a licensee has submitted a timely and sufficient application for renewal, the license doesn't expire essentially until the agency makes a final decision on that application. So though we should certainly aim to have a decision made by June 24th, if they have timely submitted an application, it does uh, afford us a little latitude um, on that particular date. So we want to make sure that a, a timely and sufficient application is made to the Commission with all the documents uh, you would like to see. To that end, in Section 1, we've identified uh, a variety of documents that we believe is very broad um, and inclusive. And you can see right in here at the, uh, the introductory sentence before the bullet points, we say that such items may include the following. If you're so inclined, we could change that to shall include uh, the following, unless um, we want to, uh, you know, keep the door open to not requiring some of these particular documents. But these are all things that uh, we've had a look at and we believe would be helpful to you uh, to really gain an understanding as to where the licensee stands at, at present. Um, the first one relates to the, the first bullet point that is, relates to the suitability. You've discussed that at a prior meeting. A letter has been issued from the Division of Licensing that's attached uh, to this particular memo. Um, it outlines all of the individuals and documents that uh, would be necessary for submission in order to refresh the uh, existing qualifiers and the suitability for the entities. Um, as part of this renewal process. So that's the, the first set of documents that would be required as part of this. 
The second, um, there are a series of attested to statements that we'd recommend. Um, the significance and the purpose of an attested statement is uh, multifaceted, but one of the things I think it does and the reason why it's useful is that it puts someone in a position of authority, someone with knowledge of a particular matter on record as telling us that a, a fact uh, um, e either exists or doesn't exist or that there is a certain compliance that's been achieved or it hasn't been achieved. And while certainly we should check this information ourselves, and we, I assume, fully intend to, I think it's helpful to put the licensee on the record itself with an attested statement. So you'll see uh, there are a number of areas here where we recommend that we uh, obtain an attested to statement by either the first one is from their CFO or someone else with uh, knowledge or um, anyone else who's able to attest to a certain set of facts. Um, so that's the purpose of the attested to statements. I don't know if you'd want to go through each one, but you can see the second one is a fairly comprehensive list of agreements um, and other compliance obligations that the licensee um, is, is under a, a present uh, obligation to satisfy. So as part of the renewal process, we would make sure that that is, in fact, the case. And much of this, of course, we do on an ongoing basis anyway. But, so this is just an opportunity to take a look holistically at their compliance program and make sure we're satisfied. Uh, the third bullet down talks about an, the status of a number of goals, including uh, gaming revenue, lottery sales and taxes, vendor spend, vendor diversity, things like that. It's an opportunity to have a look at what the goals were, whether they're accurate, whether they should be uh, recalibrated, things of that nature. So we're asking for them to attest to their compliance with those, whether they met goals, whether they haven't met goals, um, and it's an opportunity to have a fresh look at some of, of that information as well. The next bullet down talks about the conditions of licensure. And as you'll recall, each of the licensees, including uh, this one, has a comprehensive set of conditions that's attached uh, to their license. At the time that this license was awarded, we didn't even have a full set of regulations at the time. So there are certainly some elements in there that may not be wholly applicable at the present moment. So we should take a, a look at their conditions. Uh, not that they're problematic, just that we may have a regulation that governs uh, the condition, it's, which would render it duplicative in some respects. So it's a good opportunity to have a fresh, set, uh, fresh look at their conditions. The recommendation here is that we ask the licensee in the first instance to submit a proposed set of conditions um, with the understanding that if they are to remove any of the existing conditions, that they note why that is, um, that they're doing so and why it is, and that the commission can then uh, make a determination as to what the final set of conditions uh, should be. Two more bullets down, we talk about horse racing. That's obviously an important component to uh, the uh, PPC uh, operation. We ask that they provide a statement relative to their future plans for horse racing uh, at PPC and then their overall compliance uh, with the existing laws, regulations, et cetera. Uh, we get into, in the footnote, the law that governs the uh, racing requirements and the mandate that they uh, offer racing at the facility. It will at some point need to either become a condition that they continue racing or, or not. There is language in section 20, it's uh, pr uh, paragraph C, that talks about that uh, the requirement that the licensee maintain and complete an annual live racing season under chapter uh, 128A. We need not decide that today, but at some point we'll need to have a look at that language and see exactly, uh, make a determination as to its applicability uh, moving forward as well. Uh, and the same is true of section 24, where it talks about the number of racing days and things like that. 
So again, not something that needs to be decided here today, uh, but racing is obviously an important component to the renewal process um, in general. <coughs> As you'll see, as we, we work through, we talk about responsible gaming, compliance with the Play My Way, Game Sense. Um, the next bullet down, we talk about the renewal fee, which we'll get into in a moment. And then the, there is the one item that we don't uh, mention on this list that's obviously important as well is any future plans uh, that the uh, licensee may have for the facility uh, for the next five years. And we didn't. We didn't include that specifically otherwise, only because a number of these goals um, and plans that have already been submitted, including the capital expenditure plan, date beyond the expiration of the uh, initial license. Uh, so in some respects, they have already told us what their future plans are. Um, we can obviously have, a, and should, have a fresh look at those to make sure that they're still uh, meaningful and uh, are moving the uh, facility in the right direction. But we could certainly add some additional language if the commission is interested in receiving a summary or, or some type of other submission relative to the future um, plans for the facility. Mm -hmm. We can come back to that. The next section, section two, talks about the uh, renewal fee. We uh, quote, the statute here, it's section 20F of chapter 23K, it says that the renewal fee has to be based on the cost of fees associated with the evaluation of the licensee. Um, provided, however, that the cost of renewal shall not be less than $100,000. Uh, the projection that was put together is that the, uh, the cost associated with the evaluation, the suitability evaluations and what have you would come to approximately $67,000. If you factor in some of the other components that could go into it, a cost to host a public uh, hearing, which we'll talk about, things like that. It appears as though we're under or around the $100,000 threshold. Um, it would like, we could certainly do a more comprehensive analysis on that, but I think we'd be safe to set the renewal fee at $100,000, which is the statutory minimum. That amount, as we uh, address in the memo, goes into the gaming revenue fund, which uh, essentially then goes <coughs> right into the gaming local aid fund. Um, it, so these are not amounts that we retain, um, but it is certainly a, an important and meaningful fee that contributes to uh, local aid. Um, that's the, uh, the scenario on the fee. Section 3 talks about the suitability process. I know the Commission has addressed this in the past that, of course, suitability will be an important uh, component uh, to the renewal review. Uh, the Commission has offered guidance to the Division of Licensing and the IEB in the past, and we've attempted to capture that here. And again, it's, I believe, consistent with uh, the letter that was sent out by the Division of Licensing. We uh, just kind of run through here how that process would work. It's consistent and similar to the process that the Commission has used in the past to review the suitability of individuals and entities. Uh, it would um, uh, conclude essentially with a, re a report uh, to be, um, or memo issued by the IEB relative to the overall suitability of the licensee and all associated qualifiers, including not just the individual and entity suitability, but uh, regulatory compliance, things like litigation and financial stability, things of, of that nature uh, would also fall under those uh, auspices. Section four talks about a site visit. We say that the commission may elect to conduct a site visit. That might be something you uh, change to shall, that you will uh, and do intend to conduct a site visit to review things from the physical condition of the property, to inspect any capital improvements that have been made in accordance with their capital expenditure plan, to review any documents that you might want to uh, take a look at, and things of that nature. Section five talks about the, a, the public hearings or a public hearing. 
Uh, again, this is a may. This might be something you elect to adjust to a shall. Uh, bless you. We talked about a public hearing possibly being convened in or around Plainville, the host community uh, to the property. Uh, there are a number of bullet points which reflect how that process would likely unfold. Again, uh, very consistent with the way it's been done in the past, I think successfully so, um, that people would have an opportunity to come make a presentation, to speak, to submit uh, comments in advance, things of that nature. Number six is obviously an important part where we talk about the final review procedure and how once the commission has gathered all of this information and took, taken a look at any documentation, spoken to any individuals, how it will actually review and consider uh, the documents. Again, I think this is very similar to the RFA2 process that the commission engaged in when it came to the initial awards of the licenses. In fact, much of this was copied right out of that uh, regulation. Um, it's designed to afford the commission great flexibility to ensure that you can obtain whatever information uh, that you might need to make the decision to ask any questions that need to get asked. But at the same time, again, to put the licensee on notice as to what types of issues that you will be interested in and you will be considering. And th this list is intended to be uh, very similar to the list we reviewed uh, up above. Um, we include here uh, at the last bullet point that we uh, will include a review of the business ability to operate a successful gaming establishment that comes out of the suitability review. That's obviously an important component of an ongoing uh, suitability review and in consideration for renewal. The, the following uh, parts just talk about how the commission internally might go about uh, handling and processing the information that is gathered. Section seven uh, talks about just the final uh, adjudication of the matter um, that you will gather at a public meeting, uh, discuss all of this out in open as you did once before and um, issue a final decision as to whether to renew the license or not, that the license would be for a term of five years from the date of the expiration of the previous license or from the date of the renewal uh, decision, whichever one happens to be later. Number eight is just a reminder to the licensee of its obligation to cooperate uh, with the investigation. Uh, that's a statutory uh, requirement. And then part nine is a proposed timeline that we've come up with in an effort to um, establish uh, expectations as to when the commission will be reviewing certain uh, documents, taking certain action, and when the licensee will be expected to provide uh, certain information. So that's certainly a part we should take a look at as well. That is the, uh, all of the uh, components in the memo. I think if we capture all of this in some uh, form with whatever modifications, that you will then have a comprehensive set of renewal procedures that will allow us to move forward towards renewal. So just to clarify, today um, Todd would be looking for a motion from us to adopt this memorandum subject to proposed amendments. <clears throat> so uh, again, okay, I'm would sorry. you like to go first? Go ahead. Go Dan. ahead, Carl. Um, again, very comprehensive memo, well thought out. Um, I was trying to think of things as I read that, that I would add or subtract, but I really think it's, it's very well done. I agree that the um, shells could be mays. Um, I think all of those steps that are now listed as mays are appropriate for this process, including a site visit, of course, a public hearing. Oh, so you're saying may become a shell. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking, I, from what I read, I see that as an appropriate step here. Mm -hmm. Um, all of the items you have listed are certainly appropriate for our review in, um, in this uh, application, all of them important, many of them required by statute. Um, so I, I mean I just, I, I think it's very well done in an appropriate review after five years. Um, I don't see any issues that I would I would change in the timelines. Very helpful. 
which it, it lends me to think, okay, we need to move this because it's a tight timeline, and, um, but that's really helpful. Commissioner Stebbins, I think you're next. Oh. We're competing for airtime. Yeah, no, 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 no. Um, again, um, I think this is great staff work by you, Councillor, and, and Loretta and John and the rest of the team. Um, it, just to go through where some, I think some of those shells sh should be maize. Uh, the licensee may submit a proposed set of license conditions. I think yeah. we're just trying to cut down on the back and forth. Do I need to? Can I? Let's try to streamline the process for them. Um, well, maybe we should be more precise then. Yeah. Does that, uh, not to interrupt you, yeah. uh, Commissioner yeah. Stebbins, but. Yeah, there are a couple of maize that should probably stay maize. Yeah. And, yes. and a few. I was going to make that point. Yeah. 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 So, my, is this my, a good time to pause on that? Yeah. yeah. My first suggestion is the bullet at the top of page three where it says the licensee may be asked to submit a proposed set of license conditions. Keep. I would give them that choice if they so choose to do it. So they may submit. Right. I'll uh, keep that in mind. But we're not going to uh, force them if they don't want to. So it stays a may. Yeah. Uh, yes. You don't think yeah. they'll have any, maybe, huh? Yes. Well, just in it case. It stays in yeah. May, but I would just scratch no. be asked to. Just say, you may submit. You may submit. Not yeah. may be asked to. Let's just mm -hmm. clarify that we give mm -hmm. them the go-ahead if they want to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, then take out the intent, then. May so so to the extent the gaming license does not include a condition that was required, then have them explain. Mm -hmm. So take out the intent, too. Yep. Yep. Uh, I don't know if we need to talk about the $600 per machine, but. I, my recommendation would be that that be taken out um, and addressed in a separate, through a separate process. Absolutely. That's not in the letter that would go to the licensee. That was just it's included for your reference. It's, it's just more a tool of our, at our disposal more than it is. Because it's a five-year trigger. Right. It's a five-year trigger. It's a tool in the tool shed. It's not even directly relevant to the renewal it, necessarily, I, but just something to bear in mind. So if we could take put that in the parking lot and take it out of this memo. Right. Great. Thank you. Um, again, under site visit at the bottom of page five, I agree with Commissioner, can we shall conduct a site visit? Mm -hmm. We did site visits mm -hmm. as part of the due diligence originally. Yeah. We all agree sense. with that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, under the, the public hearing, uh, I would say the licensee will have at least one individual available for a public hearing. Well, should we uh, change that first May at the very top to shall? Are we, are we going to commit? Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Okay, That's shall. shall. And then where were you, um, Commissioner Stavis? Uh mm -hmm. That first bullet, uh, I would say the licensee will have. Oh. So take we'll out have, may we'll be have. required yeah. to. We'll have a whole team there. Yep. At least one person. Mm -hmm. have at least one. <laughs> um, the, maze, the the licensee uh, will make a presentation. The second bullet. Uh, I think that gets to the point that I've talked with Commissioner Grossman about. I would like to s encourage our licensees Promotion. to congratulations. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll take it. I'll take Counselor. <laughs> um, Commissioner. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's up so you like will better than shall? I do. Oh. Uh, we'll make a presentation, and I would like to offer some language. I was going to say, presentation give them some guidance. be kind of a, it can be not only what we've done in the first five years of our operation, but what some of our goals are for the next five years. Look back in the future. Um, so far, just. I'm, I'm just trying to build a consensus here around these edits. Is no, everybody in agreement? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, the next bullet, representatives of the host communities, surrounding communities impacted, ILEVs will be permitted to attend, may make a presentation, again, kind of leaving it up to them, and be available to respond to questions from the commission. Sounds good. Okay. Um, Thinking if I had one more, I don't think. On the very last bullet, no, public. I'm just wordsmithing a little bit. If it's will be permitted to attend, make a presentation and respond. May make right. a so picture. Like it's permitted right. 
attend, right. present, and respond. Will be permitted to attend, may make a presentation, and be available to respond. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's leaving it up to the organizations right. as to what they want We're to say. We're not requiring or... them to make a presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, they can if they choose to. Everything else looks good. The only thing that just kind of caught my eye on the proposed timeline is we have a March 31st licensee submission of draft initial compliance materials to commission staff, but I'm wondering if there's another date that requires the final submission of information, or is that included in one of the other dates? You know, I was, I was going to speak to this, um, and I think we may have touched on a prior conversation, and I think there's, um, there's an operating assumption here, which is that we will begin to have a number of uh, elements to this um, uh, application, really, uh, come in on a rolling basis, okay. um, so that we're not constrained to a date certain of when we begin the review. In fact, we already have begun the suitability review in, in, in many of these qualifiers. There should, there should be, uh, and, and that's a part of uh, com your point, Commissioner, um, one date when we make a determination that everything that, have, that has come in, in the past on a rolling basis is complete so that we comply with, uh, with the principle that you articulated uh, before. Um, but I wouldn't want uh, to be constrained by the notion that everything needs to be assembled for the review process only to begin at, at that time. Uh, and that goes for the site visit. Maybe they're assembling information, they're preparing the, the statements, and that's all great, that's the beginning. But as we go to the site visit, we may ask for other documents and, and, and whatnot, and they can continue to submit those. Uh, there should be, uh, uh, and this, this is, uh, again, maybe not something that we need to resolve today, especially because so long as we make the determination that the application is complete prior to June 24th, uh, we'll, we'll be in good shape. Um, but there should be that milestone where we say everybody's comfortable that we've gotten everything that we wanted. Okay. I just want to revisit, and I don't, I'm not, you know I'm not usually the uh, wordsmith in the group here, <laughs> but I think most of our regulations all say shall. So I'm just, I just, I guess I'm thinking about um, being well, consistent. A, a big differentiation that I like to make in terms of regulations is what we require of people and what we require of us. <laughs> We, I, I like to have as much flexibility as we can. Right. So all the maze that come to the commission, I will re retain them. <laughs> really, it's, 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 a, it's an important principle when it comes to regulations. Um, that you require. Yeah, what, what, what we require of the licensee is critical, and, and, you know, and, and it's important to say whether it's may or shall, and that's, that's part of what we've done here. But for example, I was gonna say. I think you were just saying will versus shall, right? Not the no. choices themselves. Oh, no. I, think, I, I was just thinking most of the work we do, we always use shall. Choice. So oh, uh, will is just oh, not a will. Will versus oh, shall. Oh, right, right, will. right, right, right. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry. That's, oh. that's all. I just, <laughs> that's fine. It just yeah. seemed yeah. to me that that was yeah. a more. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Okay, so and, I, yeah. and on the site visit, are we all in agreement that's going to be a, a mandate? Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, the only other shall, and this would be on us, they need to get written notice. So in, in six, we're talking about final review procedures. Oh. Uh, it says, second sentence says, written notice should be provided. I just think it says the commission shall provide written notice to them detailing the scope. I, I just think I'm we. I'm sorry, where were you? Um, yeah. six, six, page six, section six, yeah. final review procedures. You have once all materials have been submitted. Next sentence was written notice should be provided to the licensee. I, I do think that should say the commission shall provide written notice to the licensee detailing yeah, the scope. Mm -hmm. right. That is a place That's where fine. I think I would yeah. shall on us. Yes. I was, yeah. I was particularly thinking of. Um, all this other language that follows, which gives us the flexibility to hire consultants right. or not, right. and, and which they, it should remain a, a flexibility right. and a may, and right. we can come to that what, later. What items are you talking about? So, you know, uh, the, the licensee, uh, you know. The, what Where are you? What page? Seven. 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 Okay. Retain, no authorize the executive director to retain, for example, at the licensee's expense, you know, consultants and whatnot. 
that was important flexibility that we exercised mm -hmm. early on. Mm -hmm. See, I, at the very top it says May yes. uh, before those and that's, bullets. That's and that's what that, I would retain as We're not May. obligated. Yeah. We're not obligated. We're not yeah. obligated. Okay. Yeah. Depending yeah, on what sense. happens, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't want anybody to say, well, you didn't retain anybody. So we retain the flexibility. Yes. Where we say shall, it's we really do want to see that from the right. licensee. Right. Mm -hmm. Or we mandate ourselves. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess I have, the other, oh. que I'm sorry, the other okay. question, just to, uh, are we in common agreement that uh, the renewal fee will remain at the $100,000? That was one minimum. question we wanted. I think we should set it now in, in this uh, document because I think we've done enough due diligence on the expenses that we think it's not likely to go much further north than 100000 So, I, I would I would just make the argument that, you know, when the legislation has given us the opportunity to set, uh, whether it was the initial application, whether it was the license fee, you know, We've kept it at the minimum, hoping that more resources would be poured back into the facility as opposed to just paying for a license. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I mean, my suggestion would be to give them some assurance that $100,000 is where we would like to keep it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I, I thought we had um, talked about that in, in a prior uh, setting, and, and, but, but it's important as we are now approving this to make that clear. Um, and it's especially uh, because uh, the statute talks about, in this particular case, to be tied to the cost of investigations, which we then um, are projecting that it's going to be perhaps less than the minimum, to simply just go with this 100,000 minimum and, 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 and leave it at that. No disagreement on that? Nope. Mm. I have a couple of, um, did you have some more? No, no, I think I okay. made it when uh, it came up. Okay. I, I think that you mentioned the idea of <clears throat> whether or not we s suggest that the licensee could include future plans, <clears throat> that we might as well have that trigger, right, but not mandate. That they may. That they, yeah. I, su I, su I suppose that would be of interest to us. Um, but well, my... Um, I, I thought on that one that uh, we, 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 when we talked about the licensee's presentation, Commissioner That was going to be, but he was, uh, yeah, he happened to mention also in terms of, I ahead. think, page three. That's when you mentioned it. But I'm, as long as the licensee has put on notice that that's something that would be of interest, if it is. I mean, it's kind of, an, it's an unusual request because we're issuing a license I guess if they if it's firm enough, like uh, future plans, correct? Well, wasn't the original process the based first on was future all future plans? plans. Yes. Yeah. Right. So yes. You're not doing anything right. that you didn't do already. Right. right. So, I, yeah. so the the prior discussion had it on page six, uh, paragraph five, the second bullet. There was conversation about the licensee shall make a presentation, and there was some language about looking back and right. forward. Is right. that sufficient for this concern to just put it here, or do you want something That's else? only at the public hearing, Correct. though. And I wondered if we wanted it in, and if, um, in Earlier more, on, something uh, in writing, yeah. outlining, like a summary of any future plans or whatever. Yeah. I, 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 I feel like it is goal? a relevant part of our, of our um, review. Agreed. So. So we could put it in the application piece yeah. on, on, under number one as another bullet that says a statement relative to future plans. Yeah, and did mm -hmm. I miss it? Was it somewhere I, For else? some reason, I thought it was already in here somewhere. For and oh, there, it, it is there. Oh. oh, no, but it's only there for horse racing. Oh, well, maybe it should, we just need maybe to write it Maybe it should be for, yeah. Okay. So we would add that to the application as one of those bullet points, right. adding a statement relative to future plans for the property. Right, for, for the, the property and, yeah. all, and, and then racing. also specifically as to, to the horse race. Race. Yeah. It's the same language as the last bullet in that number right. one, but not exclusive to horse racing. Right. Right. And then the other uh, clarification I would like on the timeline, and I appreciate what Commissioner Zinnega was saying about the rolling basis and how we're going to get information coming in from the licensee on an ongoing basis. But I'm also cognizant of a mid-April public hearing, which I do feel like that's the right timing for mm -hmm. a public hearing. Mm -hmm. 
will the public be adequately informed at that time to be able to be responsive? In other words, we don't have anything about the conditions that might be, um, when would they have to let us know that they're not going to meet a condition or if they have some new future plan that is unanticipated. Should, should we have, should there be some kind of enough to, for the public to be informed? Yeah, I mean, I think that depends on what the commission wants to do. What's the purpose of the public hearings uh, on that in mm -hmm. that midday? If it is sort of that public response to the casino and it's been in operation and it's been in their community and how they okay. feel about it, right. that would be sufficient. Right. If it's public comment about the application, the application that's a whole different ballgame. Yeah. So that's that's, good, that's what very do helpful. Want to do. That's very helpful. I because it, it made me actually we think, do, if, it, if it, it made me think that at the very least we should offer some public comment period yeah. near the right. end yes. as sure. the Something renewal application the becomes really. Mm -hmm. But would the application be a public document at some point during this process? Because if you want a public comment about the application, the public would need to see the application. So the only, otherwise we need to invite a comment about the application itself. Did you do that? Yeah, what did you in do? The RFA 1, RFA 2? No, no, it was not tied to the application. There was a number of things that were uh, not a public record on the RFA 1 yeah. part, but only temporarily, mm -hmm. uh, as, as well as the RFA 2, also only temporarily. There were different levels Other of protection. Materials that were, um, what's the word we use? Uh, you know, the materials that are confidential to the yes. public, and mm -hmm. that's yeah. that does not become public. But right? the, you know, the public hearings that we did have, there had been so much groundwork laid by the licensee because mm -hmm. yes. they had to go for the host community vote. Yes. That the renderings of the building, mm -hmm. the job commitments, yes. all that was was already part of the public already, domain yeah. before we had the hearing. So they did have time to come in and Materials. talk specifically about it. But did, we did not make the, the application. Uh, it wasn't necessarily public. It wasn't, it wasn't public opining on the application on the, so no. much as giving reactions to what right. was out in the public. Right. I mean, you could do something. I mean, I, I defer to Ombudsman Ziemba, but for example, you could put out some documents such as, you know, their quarterly reports or something like that. So there is right. some information for the public to review and commenting about and the, how the Casino's doing because it's a little weird to have the app, them review the application, the public sort of review. Well, but they're the going to be doing the presentation at the mid April meeting. They want to have something to react to. So, so they'll do a presentation. Comment after that? Or, is, or do we have that go in advance? I don't know how you whether want to do that. Like have that be submitted in advance and available before they make it, or you hold it until the meeting? So I think that's a good suggestion. If, if you do have them do a presentation at the April hearing, then you just keep open the comment period so that they can submit written comments after, after that, that date. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. we that's could weigh those in the presentation. That right. would work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's and, something. <clears throat> I, I just want to uh, just. Uh, just issue a word of caution. I, I would imagine if I were in the licensee's shoes that when I'm putting together my forward-looking plans, I would be very cautious about what I include in those right, forward-looking yes. plans sure. because right. otherwise, if they're, they're just thoughts, then right. the public or others might think that they're being held to that when they're just... I, I, that was why I said it's a little bit of a right. tricky process. It's not like we're going to build the casino, so, and, and it was a known, a, a known fact. So I guess it would be only if they had some that they they a uh, future plan that was firm I'm, I'm i'm i am wondering about that yeah, especially since some of their future plans may include legislative right. approval right I, I, or private I mean, negotiations that they don't want to reveal yet right mm -hmm. yeah. i mean my my point in this was um you know we gave them a license based on what they were going to do in five years I'm not right. necessarily looking for something that I'm going to hold them hard and fast to, but it, for all the purposes we've talked about, you know, showing your hand for your comp to your competition or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, you know, some aspirational effort as to where they see themselves in the next five years. You know, you, you, for lots of reasons, you look at the original legislative intent. Even the legislature didn't want these facilities to become stagnant. It's mm -hmm. why we have a capital improvement plan. It's mm -hmm. why. Mm -hmm. All these other goals were set forward, so it's it's really to give them a chance to show where they could be in the next five years. But 
I, I'm not going to necessarily, I myself, I'm not going to necessarily hold them hard and fast to a lot of detail and when are you going to have that done? Yeah, but, but we will in all likelihood have uh, potential conditions because we'll be taking a look at the range of their plans, such as their tourism plan that they may right. need to update, some of their other plans, right. um, and they might get baked into our review process. So um, even in and of itself, even without the forward-looking statements, they'll be back and forth on a range of different things. So. I guess that is just something that we would have to flesh out further with the uh, with the licensee of what should be included in this board looking. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, let's see what we have. Uh, yeah. it, it may very well be that, you know, their plans are to continue as much as they have been doing. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we will have to see what, what they present in terms of their yeah. outlook. So, I think have we um, exhausted our suggested edits? Or, I just want uh, to confirm Karen? for my own edification. My understanding on page, basically page one under application, that you want to ch in that first paragraph. Ch there's uh, the application itself then shall consist of certain documents and other pieces of information that are submitted to the commission. Blah blah blah. Such items shall include the following. Does everyone agree that's yeah. what you want mm -hmm. to do? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Where, where was that? Page right. yeah. one, no, that paragraph. first yeah. paragraph of the word application. Yes. Yes, yes because they're all. They're, you're all so good with all those, so you yes. want them. We want okay. Them. okay. Yes. Shall require yes. all the bullets below. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, because they're they're all a statement. I mean, there's they're pre presumably okay. a lot of information there okay. that we can review, but but it's straightforward for them to say mm -hmm. to say it in a statement. So I think that's our I had one other item um, in light of what Commissioner Zuniga had mentioned regarding the maze and the shells. We put in a proposed timeline, and we meant that as really the potential timeline. But uh, because we're including in this document, we didn't include any caveats. Maybe we might need to say proposed timeline subject to amendment by the commission in parentheses. It was really meant as a guide rather than something yes. that requires us to do something on a specific date. Could you say anticipated as opposed to proposed? Yeah. And then mm -hmm. Yeah. The words. Yeah. What, what, it's a little more ideas. One thing I'll say on the timeline, um, it doesn't have to be here, but I um, I anticipate that the site visit <laughs> would happen <laughs> would happen somewhere in the uh, March or April time frame, and of course it may be more than one time, uh, so that it's you know doesn't have to be only one. One group going out there, you know, there may be a financial investigation piece. Mm -hmm. um, there may be another another group, mm -hmm. but I would want it kind of like in close proximity to what is being submitted, in case there needs to be additional documentation reviewed or not, um, and then we can go on to the review process. Well done. Mm -hmm. So do we have a motion in light of these suggested edits? Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the procedures for the renewal of a Category 2 gaming license as outlined in the memorandum included in the Commissioner's packet and as further discussed at the hearing today. Second. Any further thoughts? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Uh, Madam Chair, I further move the Commission to authorize staff to serve a letter on the gaming licensee commemorating the approved renewal procedures and to take steps to facilitate the renewal process consistent with uh, the discussion today and the timeline in the memorandum that is included in the Commissioner's packet. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5 0. Thank you. Thanks, thanks good very work. much. Nice, good nice work, work on and thanks. Commissioner Zuniga, Commissioner O'Brien. Thank you for your efforts on it, and uh, Councillor Grossman. Thank you, and everybody. Excellent. And I know Loretta. Thank you. Okay. Um, now we're moving on, to, uh, and I just want to note, um, <clears throat> for Mary Ann's purposes, we are at two thirty-three, <laughs> and once again. Or ahead of schedule. Wow. I love that. Wow. We're never, we're never behind. Never behind. 
So uh, moving on to item number nine. <laughs> I know, <laughs> exactly. So um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, item number 9A, I, I believe that we last uh, left this matter for um, action by Commissioner Zuniga to uh, convene a, a procurement management team to develop an RFP to further the executive search, uh, director search process. And do you have an update? Yes, I do. And um, we have uh, Derek Lennon join us. Derek will, uh, will help me where I uh, omit or uh, uh, um, uh, any kind of um, details that are necessary. Uh, but uh, we have um, drafted an RFR for um, uh, an executive search uh, firm or uh, consultant um, to help in the, in, in the search of an executive director. Um, we have posted an intention to post an RFR uh, that, what, that happened last week, uh, if I remember correctly, to advise um, potential respondents and bidders of the upcoming RFR that actually helps in um, in the time in in the duration of our internal process, uh, so that people know to expect the RFR while we're working on it. Um, but we're very close to a final draft of that RFR. We have assembled a team, uh, the procurement management team. Um, like in the past, it uh, includes people from different uh, disciplines here to help. Um, in this in this procurement, uh, finance, legal, um, um, diversity, um, Jill and Joe are also part of the team, uh, and 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 the and again the the RFR is ongoing and, and will be uh, issuing it shortly. It generally, uh, based on the discussions from last uh, uh, last time around, it generally stipulates two uh, phases of um, in the approach. And that is to conduct an initial assessment, I believe is the, do I need to stay clear of some of the details because of the yeah. SRFR? So what we did is we went and reviewed the commission meeting. Yes. Um, and looked at the items that were discussed in the commission meeting, which were, for the public record, um, an, internal, an internal evaluation or assessment of the agency needs and the next executive director, different ways to go about that, whether it be meetings, whether it be focus groups, whether it be um, surveys, all of that was discussed in public. Um, drafting a, a job description, um, doing outreach and recruiting, helping with scoring and setting up meetings and then kind of setting that up as a menu, all or some. That is all contained in the RFR as was requested or in the scope of services. How it's laid out yep. is... We will see what responses we get. We, we an, you anticipate that you know, some people might respond uh, you know, different from others and that's usually what happens in, right. uh, in this kind of procurement. Just like we looked at feasibilities, what you had requested of you know, the 10,000 threshold, which would be an incidental which would only require three quotes or even less than that, um, looking at statewide contracts or procurement, and the team thinks that the procurement is really the best way to go. Yeah, so um, I can answer any questions, if there are any, but uh, I think you know, yeah, we're, we're progressing as, as we intended to. And, and I think I probably have questions, but I'm gonna honor I think the system, which is that we need to allow the um, PMT to forge ahead. Yeah, so we have a timeline developed. Um, we do, as Enrique said, sent out the um, the uh, In notice of intent, intent. Notice of intent to post, even though we really didn't have to, but mm -hmm. we just wanted to give people because this didn't hit the World Trade threshold, the World Trade Organization threshold. Um, we have our criteria developed already so okay. really all we're waiting for is kind of the okay to go ahead and post and we put in we'll have language in there that identifies what the Commission wanted you can respond to one or all areas of this as the menu but you know we support partnering um, that will all be covered in the in the language um, and the areas that we sent it out to all the vendors on statewide contract for management consultants got the notice of intent as well as any vendors that had um, um, human resources or recruiting in one of their areas of expertise, um, even though they might not be on a statewide contract. We sent, they may have done 
business with someone else in the Commonwealth, they're set up as a vendor, they all got the notice. Um, so, you know, at this point, it's just really putting it into, finalizing it, putting it into the RFR, and then, you know, the timeline is, is what it is. I mean, it's, um, <laughs> it's not as short as some would like, but we are being very aggressive. <laughs> and we yep. did signal, we did signal yes. in, in our language our expectations for timing from the vendors to make sure that expediency is a preference and is acknowledged that this is something that we're looking for here. Mm -hmm. um, so we tried to really go back and look at the commission meeting, the couple meetings, and hit on every topic and cover it in there. Um, now, once again, once it gets posted, um, or if you guys want to see it before it gets posted, there is a way to get you so that you're a non-voting voting member because in our composition we've already identified who are the voting members and who are the non-voting members. So if you want to see it right before it gets posted, and be non-voting members in case you have any um, discussion or want to go to you know one of us and say hey we really like this clarified can can you as the procurement team go back and think about it we can do that or you can wait until it gets posted it's a public document and then we can always amend it um, you know that we have both of those options Todd on the um, earlier version that doesn't run against the um, open meeting law with the first version if where we, we looked at it as a non-voting member. Well, You'd give your I mean, comments back to the procurement there. team. Mm -hmm. so it's the status of our lives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, um, perhaps that could work, but your point is, is in the event there was some kind of a, an, an issue that seemed you know, critical really enough, it, we saw. could amend and that would be acceptable. It okay. is, it is acceptable. Writing. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Good. Um, and we are going to post in the, um, with the gaming, um, we're members of a couple of prominent ones, um, you know, IMGL yep. and Niagara. Lots of people in this industry look to those for postings. So we'll work with Elaine. Yes. Like we've done in the past once we, okay. um, once we're ready to post this to get it. Um, mm -hmm notified, just like we did with the RFI. Okay. Um, we'll work with Elaine to make sure we get as much coverage as we possibly can mm -hmm. in the areas that we should be hitting on to make sure that... Mm -hmm. the yeah, I actually received two inquiries for other searches and I said, sorry, we've got our hands full here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, that is a good point. Um, everybody knows that there's different resources available, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Excellent work. Thank you, Commissioner Zuniga. Thank you. And, and Derek, thank you so much. I just get to take the credit as usual. <laughs> Most of the work gets done by others. <laughs> Quite the contrary. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we have um, eight and nine B. Um, <clears throat> as uh, folks know, um, when we issued our uh, decision on the wind resorts matter in at the end of April last year, um, in addition to a fee, several conditions were imposed, uh, and one was to um, requiring uh, uh, us to appoint an independent monitor. That independent monitor was selected through a pro uh, competitive procurement process and, and um, decided here in a public hearing. Uh, part of the requirements of the um, independent monitor is to produce a six-month baseline uh, study and uh, we um, s just as a to set the stage the the rules if you will were our hope was that the independent monitor and uh, the li licensee would be able to just work together there have been a few uh, you know calls and and uh, questions raised they continue to work together. However, uh, the independent monitor is requesting a very straightforward extension uh, in order to complete uh, the, the baseline in, in the fashion that uh, they, they need. So they've asked for an extension from uh, March, March 5th to a later date in, in March. 
So it's not a long extension. Not a long extension. No. I think they anticipate a few weeks, like yeah, a couple a few weeks, weeks. Probably the week of the 23rd. But yeah. Right. And we don't want to hold them to a particular date month. at this time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but in terms of uh, that process, we anticipate that report being presented. Um, Commissioner O'Brien has uh, provided um, support um, to me only because I'm the contract uh, point, uh, but I think we anticipate that that will be presented in public yes. with an invitation to the licensee mm -hmm. to also be here. Yep. We'll have to figure out exactly that process. I think that, you know, what it, um, you know, if it's a public hearing versus something else, but you'll give us those directions, Todd, and uh, we should expect that sometime near the end of March or beginning of April. I think, I think the anticipation is the hearing or the report? Um, the, hearing. the hearing, yeah. Does that sounds appropriate. Mm -hmm. yep. sounds yeah. appropriate? Yeah. Sounds It seemed very reasonable. Uh, the the uh, um, independent monitor has been um, nothing but professional with <coughs> us and, of course, independent, and that's the key. So um, I think this is a fair, fair request. I have a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission grant the independent monitor's request for an extension for the submission of the um, six-month baseline. The deadline currently set for March 5th be extended uh, to a date prior to the end of March. Second. Any further questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And opposed? 5-0. Okay, any other business commissioners? Nope. Motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero. Thank you. Good job.